the moment we've all been waiting for. Fight fans are back. Bellator MMA brings you three action-packed cards from Mohegan Sun Arena featuring three championship bouts. Douglas Lima defends the welterweight crown against the 25-0 Yaroslav Amazov. Valentin Moldovsky takes on Tim Johnson in an interim heavyweight title fight. And newly crowned flyweight champion Juliana Velasquez defends against Denise Kuholtz. Plus, some of the most electrifying names in MMA going head to head, all looking to earn their shot at Bellator Gold. Don't miss Bellator MMA action live from Mohegan Sun Arena. Limited tickets are available. Visit Ticketmaster or Bellator.com for more details. Bellator Nation, follow us across a large array of digital platforms and stay up to date on everything you need to know. Like us on the Bellator Facebook page and see exclusive videos. Follow us and get instant updates on Twitter at Bellator MMA and get a chance to have your tweet live on the broadcast. See amazing pictures on Instagram at Bellator MMA. Join Bellator Nation today. Douglas Lima is the division king. That right hand is Three-time Bellator world champion. Yaroslav Amazov is seemingly unbeatable at 25 and 0, riding the longest active winning streak in MMA. Something's gotta give. Are you tough enough? Better prove it. Bellator MMA live tonight on Showtime, where warriors rule. Egan Sun Arena for another stacked fight card. This is Bellator 260 headlined by a welterweight world title fight. The champion, the phenom, Douglas Lima, who is widely regarded as one of the most dangerous welterweights in the sport. He puts his belt on the line versus the undefeated 25-0 Yaroslav Amosov. The countdown is on. Well, welcome into the fight sphere, everyone. I am Jen Brown, and we'll be at the fight desk all night long. Joining me to break down all the fight choreograph choreography, of course, is none other than Mr. Big John McCarthy. Welcome back to the desk with me. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be here. And joining us for the first time, making his fight desk debut, Mr. Michael Venom Page. Looking forward to having you here. Oh, man, it's exciting. It's a, it's a debut for me in a different way, so I'm excited to be here. Well, we're excited about it as well. Okay, we've got a stacked card. Lots of great fights coming your way, but I know there's one one that you have your eye on specifically tonight. That is oh, our yeah. main event. It is a welterweight world title fight. Our champ, Douglas Lima, he is taking on the unbeaten Yaroslav Amosov. Now, John, when we talk about championship fights, we always like when they intrigue us. This one certainly does. Why should fight fans be excited about this matchup tonight? Oh, it's real simple. You've got a guy in Yaroslav Amosov who is unbeaten. Anytime you have somebody unbeaten in their career, there is that mystique about why is he special? What is he doing that no one else is been able to figure out can Douglas Lima figure out that puzzle we're gonna find out Michael what do you think about that why do you think no one has been able to figure out Amosov what makes him so dangerous what makes him so dangerous is he, he is an all-around MMA fighter like a, a straight nine out eight nine out of ten in every area of MMA we normally see people specialize in specific areas, but he is quite competent everywhere, and that's what makes him so dangerous. Well, let's talk about Douglas Lima real quick, because you can't talk about him and not talk about those leg kicks. He's so effective. He's explosive. And the opponents know they're coming, yet they're still so effective. Why, John? They're effective because, let, let's be honest, I always believe it was George Masvidal was the guy that started that low calf kick. And that low calf kick has absolutely changed the sport. Yep. People have to be aware of it. But he's the one that kind of started it. Benson Henderson kind of made it better. Douglas Lima put his name on it. He has tattooed that kick, not only in, in the course of the sport, 
but he has tattooed it onto his opponents. He has. He is dynamic with that kick. It's 100%. It's the first thing you think about when you're even coming to fight Doug, someone like Douglas Lima. It's that leg kick. You've seen how damaging it is across the board in every single opponent that he's fought. So you have to take that into consideration when you're fighting him in the same way I had to. Well, we're going to get to your matchup with him a little bit later. Talk about that. All right, that is our main event. It is coming up later on tonight uh, on Showtime. Here's a look at the rest of the fight card. Our co-main event, it features knockout artist Paul Daly. He's taking on Jason Jackson. Really excited for that one. Plus, we've got Aaron Pico. He's riding a three-fight win streak. He's taking on Aiden Lee. And then the night, it'll kick off with a welterweight showdown between DeMarquez Jackson and Mark Lemminger. Four incredible fights, nine Eastern, six Pacific on Showtime. Now let's kick off the night and head back down, head down cage side, that is, to the rest of our broadcast team. We got Mauro Ronaldo and Josh Thompson. Hey, guys. All right, Jen, thank you very much. A six-pack of prelim scraps to wet your whistle before the main card at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on Showtime. It takes place, the opener in the light heavyweight division, Alex Polizzi against Bellator newcomer Gustavo Trujillo. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the first fighter of the evening, the Cuban assassin, Gustavo Trujillo. I feel like I'm going back to my Stampede wrestling days for the legendary Hart family, a legendary figure by the name of the Cuban assassin used to stomp through the professional wrestling rings. But Josh, Gustavo Trio, he is the real deal, a Cuban national Greco-Roman wrestler who brings a three and one record to the Bellator MMA cage. And all three of his wins have come inside the distance, two via knockout and one via triangle choke. Yeah, you have to remember with him though is that he may have a wrestling background and pedigree, but the thing is, is he actually comes out and likes to throw punches. He puts himself in danger. That sometimes will get him in trouble, leave himself out of position. But I gotta tell you, Moro, he's fun to watch. Yeah, you're right. He does usually eschew his wrestling base, his decorated wrestling base, in order to try to end his fights with flashy knockouts. And, well, we saw that in his last outing, a fight that lasted 35. Seconds. Yeah, he possesses the power and he understands that. So he just walks people down, he touches them. But like I said, he sometimes will leave himself in jeopardy to get hit, which makes it more fun for the fans and for us, obviously, here sitting here calling the fights. But he used, he only relies on his wrestling when he needs to or when he feels like potentially the exchanges are not going his way. And I gotta tell you, that makes it fun for everybody. Commitment, discipline, and striking. Those are his three greatest strengths according to the Cuban assassin. And now we welcome his opponent, Alex Easy Polizzi. Nothing came easy for Alex Polizzi in his last fight in the Bellator MMA cage at Bellator 251. He was outpointed by Julius Anglickskis. And when we talked to him, Josh Polizzi told us, hey, if eating jabs was an admirable skill, I, I did pretty well in that. And then he said, of course, in seriousness, he should have utilized his wrestling earlier. He was a three-time NCAA qualifier at Northwestern University. So taking the loss and hopefully learning and building on that experience. Yeah, we got to remember, Julius Anglick is, is very, very tough. He's a stud. And, and that was one he ran into. He just ran into a brick wall. And that happens from time to time. He's going back to the drawing board. I want to see if he's made any changes from that. His wrestling is dominant. He's got a great top position. He likes to lay down the vicious ground and pound. It really just comes down to him making sure that he's made those little adjustments from his last fight to see if he can get him into this fight. All right, let's take a look at the tail of the tape for our opening encounter. It takes place at 2.05. Yeah, you can see that Gustavo has a four and a half reach advantage, and he's gonna plan to use it. He's gonna walk him down, and he's gonna try to touch him with the hands and let it fly. With the official introductions, here's the voice of Bellator MMA, Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome back inside Mohegan Sun Arena as we get set now to kick off tonight's Bellator 260 prelims with three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. 
Introducing the blue corner first. At six foot three, weighing in 205 and one quarter pounds. His professional record, three wins, one loss. Hailing from Ciego de Avila, Cuba. He fights out of Raleigh, North Carolina. Gustavo, the Cuban assassin, Trujillo. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner. At six foot, weighing in 205 pounds, even as a professional. Seven victories, just one defeat from Madison, Wisconsin. Introducing Alex E.Z. Polizzi. In charge, your referee, Blake Grice. Back up, back, back, back. Blake Rice, the third man in the cage. Alex Polizzi, one and one in Bellator MMA, welcoming up, Gustavo Trujillo. Ready? Ready? Fight. Trujillo Get in up, the blue up. gloves. Polizzi in the red gloves, and immediately Polizzi comes forward looking for the single leg takedown right from the jump. And instead, the Cuban Greco national wrestler puts Polizzi on his back. Polizzi came up to the body lock, and that's not where you want to be with the Greco-Roman wrestler. Trio working from top position. Polizzi trying somehow to get back to his feet, scramble. Trujillo doing a good job just maintaining the position. He's got that far side hook over the arm. Now he's got the leg right as well if he wants. Take down by Trujillo from the waist block. We have passed one minute here in the opening round, scheduled for three at 205, and Polizzi wearing the big backpack in Trujillo. Trujillo doing a good job of making sure he stays over the top. Start, now he's going to start to bring that right leg around potentially to try to throw that other hook in and then try to make him carry all of his body weight. <clears throat> Polizzi coming off his lone loss after beginning his career with seven consecutive wins, but in tough here in the opening 90 seconds against the debuting Gustavo Trujillo. Great job on the lift. He's got to turn him off the fence, make sure he gets the slam. They're, you want to try to slam them away from the fence, because if you don't slam them away from the fence, they can put their back to the fence and start to get back up right away. You see Polizzi working on that guillotine right there. Not going to probably be able to get it, but it's also threatening, so it makes sure he'll make the stand back up to try to defend. Polizzi has two submission wins as he's put back on his back by Trujillo, working some ground and pound as he looks to perhaps take Polizzi's back. But Polizzi turning into Trujillo, still grounded. What happens is a lot of wrestlers will drill this, this exact te these type of moves. It's called mat return. So what right now is Trujillo is mat returning him back to the ground, and Polizzi is actually standing back up every single time right away. So that Trujillo tends to get a little bit more tired with the mat returns over and over, and then the takedowns come less often. Two mixed martial artists with wrestling backgrounds, and now Polizzi going to try to maximize his position here, full mount. This is where Trujillo tends to have problems though when guys get on top of him, he has a hard time getting them off. And you know a thing or two about knee bars. You recorded one in your lone uh, victory in Japan for Pride Fighting Championships as Trio was fishing there momentarily, now working from the open go half guard. If you're gonna get one, now's the time to get him while you're still dry. Under two minutes left here in the first round. The difference between Trujillo and, and Polizzi and how they control the position mind. is that Polizzi is able to actually control the position and hold him there, whereas Trujillo wasn't able to hold Polizzi down. He kept standing up right away. Polizzi has a rear naked choke victory on his resume, looking to flatten out Trujillo. Coming up on the, the final 90 seconds. So he starts lifting the chin so he can start working the other arm underneath. Good job by Trujillo to turn to his side and start to maybe turn and face him. Takes away that rear naked threat. Trujillo utilized his wrestling background to take down Polizzi in the early going. And now Polizzi fishing for the rear naked choke. Polizzi coming back here in the opening round and now has Trujillo in 
trouble. It's under the chin, but he's on the right side. So all Adrio has to do is now start sliding his back flat to the ground. He see it starts coming off. The arm starts coming from underneath the chin. And Adrio able to escape that submission attempt as Belize looks to mount again. That's nice work right there when you're making the guy on bottom scramble as much as please he's making Trujillo scramble. Start hitting him to the stomach because they're not prepared for that. Starts taking their wind out of him again. He's attacking that arm bar now. Polizzi's catchphrase, pain, shame, and temporary tattoos. And Alex Polizzi gets it done. And yeah, in many ways, didn't make it look easy until the end. Mr. Polizzi made it look easy. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex Polizzi, who was able to overcome the early takedowns of Gustavo Trio and uh, Polizzi improving to eight and one, two and one in the Bellator MMA cage as Trio tastes defeat for the second time, gets finished for the first time in his career. And here was the early wrestling by Trio that we talked about, Josh. This was the story of the round, though, is that what happened? He kept taking him up and taking him down. He exhausted himself. And when it came to the scrambles, once Polizzi got on top, you saw that he wasn't able to get Polizzi off of him. So Polizzi made some exchanges, got to the top, got to the back, made the transition, got close to this rear naked, wasn't able to finish it. Great job by Trujillo pulling that top hand off. But when it came to attacking the army, he already exhausted all of his energy trying to defend. He got stuck with his back flat to the ground, was able to attack the arm bar. Uh, Polizzi makes it verbally tap as well as tapping. Great job by Alex Polizzi. Pain, shame, and temporary tattoos. Well, he secures a permanent victory via submission as Alex Polizzi gets it done in our opening bout here at Bellator 260. <laughs> you gotta live with that now. <laughs> Coaches? Do I count? Can I count? Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, inside the Bellator cage, the straight arm bar brings on the tap officially. Four minutes, 22 seconds in round number one. The winner by submission, Alex E.C. The most celebrated high school wrestler from his hometown of Beloit, Wisconsin, Alex Polizzi, picks up the first straight armbar submission win of his career. He now has three submissions on his resume as he improves to two and one here in the Bellator MMA cage, eight and one overall. Let's go up to Josh Thompson. I'm here with the winner, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Polizzi. Hey, great job on the mat returns. He kept lifting and slamming. He started to look like he got a little bit exhausted from all the lifts and takedowns. Talk to me about how you were able to get back up and kept working to get back to your feet. You know, uh, the plan was always to come in and make use of my wrestling. Uh, and I know a lot of times people think of that and it's takedowns and right on top, but you gotta be able to get in there. He took me down at first, able to keep coming up, coming up, coming up. And there's lots of different ways to put pressure on guys and that just happened to be one of them. Ended up getting that reversal. After that, it was just a, a battle of attrition that came out on top. So there was a lot of attempts on the submissions, and you went from the rear naked, and then when you made the transition back to the top, you were able to get the straight arm bar. Talk me through that. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, w once I'm on top of a guy, I like to maintain that position. Really like that uh, reverse twister. Keep eyes looking at his legs and keep his head away from look, seeing what I'm doing. That way we can switch off to things like that rear naked choke, switch it over, make sure we're staying on top. And then it's just, he's thinking about one thing, thinking about the next, trap that arm while it's, while it's vulnerable. Welcome to getting back on the winning track. With ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Alex Polizzi. Impressive bounce back performance for Alex Polizzi here in the Bellator MMA light heavyweight division. Let's go back to Jen Brown at the fight desk. Well, thanks, Mario. Yes, that was an impressive win. You know, John, we looked at both of these guys on paper, both really great wrestling backgrounds. What was the difference maker in this one? And, you know, it's little things in fights that yeah, make yeah. big differences. And what you saw with what Alex Polizzi was doing when he was taken down and what Josh was talking about, the way he was getting up, 
and then where you would see Trujillo actually take him back down again and the work that he was doing. Then when Belize finally got that little reversal, got on top, it was the difference of his body positioning and not making the mistakes that Trujillo made. We talked about trying to make big things happen. You can't do that all the time. Take your time. Let things work themselves out. Take your time, of course. It's the first round. You've got another two rounds to correct that decision. If you, there's no need to rush. Um, for me, he the diff the main difference is the fact that he couldn't control once he took him down. Yeah, and that's the main difference. Once it was reversed, the difference with Polizzi is he was able to control the top position and then take 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 it from there. I was wondering, is that I mean, Trujillo looked good. I mean, he was able to get out of a couple of those submission attempts. So hats off to both these guys. Yep. Well, they both have a lot of talent. And look, Alex Polizzi has got one loss on his record. He is very, very good in his wrestling. He's able to control people. And most of the time, he doesn't come up with a submission. He likes to use ground and pound, so it was nice to see him use that straight arm. All right, well, he moves to 9-1 and one inside uh, the cage tonight. All right, well, that is a perfect way to start our night here for Bellator MMA. We've got four great fights coming your way. Let's talk about our co-main. It's got a lot of fight fans excited, myself included. It's got the most dynamic knockout artist in the sport today, Paul Daly, taking on the number three ranked welterweight Jason Jackson. Now, this is a catch weight of 175. This will be Daly's third fight at 175. John, how much is the difference for him in those five extra pounds? I am telling you right now, for Paul Daly, those five extra pounds are everything. Look, there is a 175 pound weight division in the unified rules. Now, most promotions don't use it, but Bellator knows that Paul Daly is an exciting fighter and they want to see a fight. He is not going to have an easy time getting back to 170. Those five pounds are huge for Paul Daly. He's got energy. He doesn't kill himself to get down to it, and he can come out and fight a great fight. When we talk about uh, Daly's power, uh, what does Jason Jackson need to do to make sure that he doesn't get drawn into that brawl that you know Daly's known for? You know, because that could be devastating, as we've seen from so many of his opponents. It's about staying true to your game plan that you come in with. Don't feel pressure to be, feel prideful in any single moment. If you get caught, reset and then come back. Don't feel to fight in those, don't fight from a bad position. I always say the same thing. My coach always tells me the same thing. If you get hit, don't fight from that position, adjust. Correct it, start on a good foot. And that's what he needs to do in this fight. He needs to start on the, on the front foot, keep, keep Daly on his back foot. It takes a little bit of power out. He's always going to be dangerous, but it takes a little bit of power out and stay true to your game plan. And Michael is exactly right. Is You cannot get into this, oh, he hit me, I have to hit him back right now. You have to maintain that distance. Jason Jackson has got a fantastic jab. If he gets into that gunslinging match with Paul Daly, he's looking to lose the fight. If he maintains his distance, maintains his composure, realizes, I don't have to win every second of this fight, I just have to win the majority, that's how he gets his win. All right, well, we look forward to seeing these two throw down. That's our co-main event coming up later on tonight. All right, up next, female featherweights take the stage and the cage to break down this bout. From Bellator's London office, here's Gareth A. Davies. A women's featherweight matchup tonight sees the collision of heavy-handed Californian Amanda Bell and Russian former Sambo standout Marina Moknagina. Amanda Bell goes by Cage Sobrigay, the lady killer, for a reason. She'll be seeking a stand-up brawl against the submission specialist Moknatina from Perm, the city once known as Molotov. And it will be a cocktail of fists and fury versus locks and holds as the Russian fighter looks to rebound from a loss to Janae Harding on her Bellator debut. Marina has won four of her six fights by submission using the skills that made her a legendary six-time world champion in Sambo. Bell's 7-7 seven and seven win-loss sequence suggests a victory here after defeat to Leslie Smith last time out, but she won't want to play Russian roulette on the ground, so expect a fast, aggressive start from the number eight ranked 145-pounder as the USA meets Russia. Styles make fights. And in this one, it's all about, guys, who can apply their superpower. Cheerio to the Prince of Punditry from across the pond. Gareth A. Davies breaking down this female featherweight matchup. The number eight ranked Amanda Bell meets Marina Mahnakina. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome our next fighter. This is Marina Mahnakina. She is as tough 
as it is to say her surname. Say the name, Josh Thompson. Marina Mahat Nakina, who turned 33 last month, and she comes to Bellator tonight looking to well move to one and one she made her bellator debut at bellator 219 march of 2019 losing to janae harding via unanimous decision and so she's been away from the cage and this big of a stage for a long time yeah a lot of fighters that, that are live over overseas they've been away for a while because of visa problems visa issues or travel issues because of uh 2020 covid but she's back now in the cage and i'm hoping hoping to see her have a dominant performance she needs to get back on the winning track yeah and she's been able to train in with a gang at sanford mma and has been uh, sparring completely with the guys as she gets ready for this important fight at 145, looking to get, as you mentioned, back on the winning track and, and prove that, well, she's more than just a colorful character. She is a formidable fighter. You know what West Coast is gonna tell me? This and now, is Amanda, the lady kill her. a fired up Amanda Bell looking to bounce back from uh, taking an L in her last fight she faced the very tough Leslie Smith who went uh, what was it within nine seconds or so of going the distance with Chris Cyborg in that featherweight title fight as we saw and for Amanda Bell she's she looks to be a bruiser in this fight. She wants to bully her opponent. Yeah, she's a junkyard dog. She's someone that walks you down, hits you with big shots, makes you fight out of your comfort zone. If she's able to do that tonight to Mahatma Tina, then I think she's gonna have a great, I think she'll have a great night and she'll come out here with a victory if she can impose her will. Her three stoppage victories in Bellator, female featherweight competition tied for the most in divisional history or three knockout victories are tied for the most in divisional history so amanda bell hoping to make a little history and get back in the win column let's take a look at the 411 for this fight at 145 yeah, she's got a Amanda Bell has a four and a half reach advantage advantage. So all she's got to do is just keep Marina on the edge of her uh, jab or her punches. With the official introductions here once again is Michael C. Williams. For those joining us tonight live on YouTube at Bellator MMA and Showtime Sports, we welcome you to the Bellator 260 prelims here inside Mohegan Sun Arena. We'll go now to the featherweight division set for three five-minute rounds. Introducing the blue corner at five foot six, weighing in 145 and one half pounds. Her professional record: four wins, two losses from St. Petersburg, Russia. Presenting Marina. And across the cage, her adversary fights out of the red corner at five foot seven, weighing in 145 pounds, even as a professional. She stands at seven and seven. She fights out of Salem, Oregon. Amanda, the lady killer, Bell. In charge, your referee, Brian Miner. Brian Miner, the man in the middle for this female featherweight encounter. Amanda Bell at 7-7 seven and seven overall, facing off with Marina Mahatnakina, who is 4-2. And, and it's Bell in the red gloves, Mahatnakina in the blue gloves. It's been over two years since Mahatnakina seen pro MMA action. I'm trying, Josh. <laughs> Marble mouth Ronaldo here. You're a better man than me. At least you've been trying. <laughs> and immediately, Bell, looking to establish the jab, wants to establish her stand-up game and dominate in that domain. Inside calf kick by Mahat Nakina. Mahatnakina has got to be careful not just getting lazy with the kicks because she's already got caught one time by Amanda Bell with the very first leg kick that was slow. Mahatnakina gets to work with a sublime striking coach in Henry Hooft down in the Sunshine State, but 
Like all martial arts disciplines, Josh, it takes years and years to master. Although, she does throw a couple of punches, but leaves her chin straight up open for the counter. Yeah, Henry Hoops has got a plethora of top, top fighters down there to, to go ahead and help him also, too, with the coaching. Nice kick there on that calf kick, though, from Hakakina. Trying to showcase the wrinkles that she has been adding to her overall game, all winding up with that catapult-like right hand at Amanda Bell. Meanwhile, the veteran still surveying the landscape, Josh, trying to collect data, maybe trying to time Mahatma. Yeah, but you gotta remember, during that duration, two years off, there's a lot of things that have changed. So Mahat Nineteen has already showed that she's kicking a lot more. She's actually implementing that overhand right. Before, it was a lot of just straight one, two, one, two. She's grown a lot already, just from what I've seen in her striking. Was working with Henry Hook. Mahat Nakina, after beginning her career with four consecutive wins, trying to snap a two-fight losing streak and off to a strong start here against the number eight ranked Amanda Bell. This is where it fails. Favors Mahak Nakina because she's great on the ground. Leg locks, transitions to the knee bars, all of those type of submissions are available. She's a six-time Sambo world champion. And so she's somebody that can just get in there and get after her when it comes to the grappling aspect of it all. Manakina saying all the right things, saying she came to Bellator to become the champion. And she feels there is nobody that can stop her on the way to her goal as she is bringing the fight to Amanda Bell as we pass the midway point of the first frame, and they continue to jockey for position, expending energy along the fence, Josh. Yeah, she's doing a great job of keeping the underhooks. Notice how she's holding that underhook high on that left side. That's gonna keep Amanda Bell's back pressed up against the fence. And Bell has had to endure her fair share of trials and tribulations like all of us have over the past year due to the COVID pandemic has found it difficult to just try to maintain fighting shape with all of the personal things that one has to deal with. And yet, Maid Waden is here tonight to try to resurrect the momentum in her career. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to kind of what state you live in, you know, because some states were open and some states weren't, and some states lifted the restrictions a little bit sooner, and the, the fighters were able to get in there. She's out of the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, and that's it. She's out of North, uh, Salem. Salem there. by way of Spokane as yep. she continues to try to stifle Mahatnakina's attack here, putting her weight on as Mahatnakina fishing for the single, and now Amanda Bell looking to try to break the grip, but she's seated. Momentarily. She was reaching over the back to try to hit that Kimura, but she got to push the head to the outside to go to try to hit that, or at least threaten it enough to where Mahat Makina would let go of the grip. And Amanda Bell has one submission win on her record. And that was against Brittany Elkin way back in April of 2014 as we come up on the final 60 seconds of the opening round between Amanda Bell and Marina Mahanakina. And Mahanakina told us that her greatest strength is her wrestling and her ground game. As you mentioned, Josh, a master of sports in Sambo and yet finding it difficult to bring this fight to the mat. Yeah, it's not always, though, about bringing the fight to the mat as much as it's controlling the position and going ahead and letting your strikes fly from there. They this break is, apart. This is where Amanda Bell wants to be, though. She wants to be right there on that outside, but letting her hands go. Right now, she's a little hesitant. She's not pulling the trigger. And as we've mentioned, Marina Manakina already showcasing improvements in the stand-up department due to the time she's already spent in Sanford MMA. Yeah, because, and like we get back to the to the COVID talk though, is that she, the gyms were open and she was able to train the majority of the time. Fierce exchange there as we come to the end of round one. Mahanakina acquitted herself well, Josh, in the first five minutes. Yeah, I thought she did a great job. She was able to get a takedown, ride Amanda Bell a little bit there, and in position, Amanda Bell was able to get back I to her feet, this. but she kept Amanda Bell hey. pressed against the fence. Great job. No. We're going to listen into the corner here to see what you guys has to say. The jab, yeah? Touch, touch, and straight. No jab, you beat her all the time, jab. Now, when you get her on the fence, boom. Yeah? More water, more water. Hey, hey, ding, ding, not this. This, this, and then this, yeah? Da, da? Da. You having fun? <laughs> hey, yeah! Yeah, just, just counter him. Bring that left back up. Keep the pressure, keep the pressure. One more? Your hands are faster. 
fucking great. That's fucking great. Yeah, that's cool. Ready? Ready? Come on. Bell and round two. Female featherweights going at it. Amanda Bell in the red gloves. Marina Mahatnatkina in the blue gloves. And Josh Bell told us that she felt her striking would overwhelm her opponent. She has to ratchet up the striking in this round if that's to be the case. Yeah, so her corner told her to keep the pressure on, but she's also gonna throw when you're keeping the pressure on. You can't just put pressure without throwing something off of that pressure. And so that's kind of where she needed to be. Mahatnatkina's corner told her to stop throwing big loopy punches, start throwing them straight. And also, the number one thing that I think for younger fighters is to have fun out there. I know it's hard to say for the people at home listening, going, have fun, you're fighting. But I always have fun here at this. <laughs> we're not fighting. <laughs> exactly. But no, that's honestly, fighters generally will perform better when they are out there having fun because this is what they're doing, what they love. This is still a sport, they're but still this, enjoying this. These kinds of battles can't be fun. Meanwhile, Josh, the, the, the battle for position where every millimeter, every inch counts and, and energy she is being expended here. Yeah, what Amanda Bell needs to do is see how she has the right side underhook. She needs to elevate that underhook to turn Mahatnakina back to the fence. If she can do that, then she can at least make space to get away, or she can keep her pressed against the fence. But right now, she's not able to do that. Another way of doing it as well, if you guys are at home watching, is Amanda Bell can lift up on the chin to drive her forehead underneath Mahakahina's uh, chin as well, and then that'll stretch her out and make it easier for her to get off the fence. In a division bereft of depth, an impressive performance here tonight would definitely capture the attention of the matchmakers as, again, Chris Cyborg successfully defending her featherweight crown against Leslie Smith. And again, Marina Mahakahina still very early in her career, but again, we talk about opportunities presenting themselves, Josh. Yeah, fighting the number eight fighter in Bellator and Amanda Bell. If she gets a win, that puts her right into that top 10 rankings. And Bell coming back with some knees as Manatina has that right hand. Oh, right hand landed on Amanda Bell. strikes, but we're seeing improvements in that department. There's no question. I've seen a lot of improvement. It's keeping Amanda Bell on her toes. She's not able to throw. It's making her hesitant to throw punches. And that's normally not her forte. She likes to get in your grill and get after you. And the bell looking for that spinning attack and again eats that right cross. The right cross continues to be there for Mahanatina and she's navigating the range very well, Josh. Yeah, she's doing a good job off the exchanges as well. As soon as they break, she throws off of that as well. And meanwhile, Amanda Bell continues to show hesitancy, Josh. You know what I'm seeing from Amanda Bell? She's stalking, but nothing's being yes. thrown, which is one thing. But then she's, oh, I think she's having a hard time with Mahakahina's uh, footwork. And so the footwork and the movement is really throwing her off. And Mahakina attacking the lead leg with the cap kick, body kick, as Bell countered with some arm punches. Under 90 seconds left here in the middle frame, and Bell continues to walk down Mahanakina, but it's Mahanakina who initiates the attack, Josh, and, and is diversifying, going downstairs and upstairs, throwing herself momentarily off balance, though. But even after she lands, what she does is she moves out, and Amanda Bell's not quick enough to stalk after her from there. And doesn't move out li in a linear fashion, moves out angles, circles, and of course, when you're under the, the learning tree of Henry Hooft, you will learn every single nuance of striking. Nice. She's got to be careful, though, throwing her hands down when she's throwing that low kick, because Amanda Bell's caught her twice throughout this fight with those lazy kicks. Caught her with that left hand there. 45 seconds left in the round. And again, Manakina attacking the lead leg. And it may be getting to already show dividends as Bell having difficulty standing on it, it seems. Yeah, it's already starting to swell down there. She's switching her stance. You can see the pain starting to set in. She's having to stop very carefully. And it's so great to hear the sound 
track of actual fans in the stands, a limited audience here with us at the Mohegan Sun Arena, and they are supporting these Warriors in the featherweight division as Amanda Bell was coming forward, but Marina Mahatkina continues to showcase her striking as Bell closes the quarters. And what a turnaround by Mahatkina. Well, Saturday, June 19th, undefeated Jermall Charlo puts his middleweight belt on the line in front of his hometown of Houston, Texas. The power-punching contender Juan Macias Montiel will be the opponent in his Showtime Championship Boxing Saturday, June 19th from H-Town right here on Showtime. Can't wait to be back in the Lone Star State as the Female fighting out of the Sunshine State continues to showcase her striking, Josh. Yeah, Mahak Nakina is doing a great job at that calf kick. You could tell the first couple ones in the first round landed, but it was the second round that she started having a lot of success with it, especially towards the end in that last minute. You see Amanda Bell is having a hard time putting her weight on it. Now she just looping punches and hoping something lands as the kick is thrown. The king of the calf kicks, Bellator welterweight champion Douglas Lima defends the title against Yaroslav Amazov in the main event. We have Marina Matnakana, who's utilized the calf kicks very well here in this fight against Amanda Bell, the third and final round. As the number eight ranked, Amanda Bell has to try to find a way to find the target as she just did with that right hand. And it's coming off of those kicks, so every time she throws a lazy kick, every time Marina throws a lazy kick, Amanda Bell is able to capitalize on that. She's got the reach advantage, so she's able to touch her. Nakina, she needs to make sure when she's throwing those kicks, though, that her hands stay up. She has a tendency to lower her hands as she throws. The story of this fight, though, so far, outside of the calf kicks, is the movement. Mahak Nakina is doing a good job of landing her strikes and moving, and Amanda Bell, now even with the compromised leg, is having a hard time getting after her right after she lands. Bell is closing the gap both in terms of distance and in terms of her totals in the striking department as Manakina now retreating on her back foot, perhaps attempting to set a trap but moving laterally. There's a counter right by Mahanakina as Bell clinches, shoulder strike. Yeah, what she needs to do is I feel like she needs to make the space. I know she's caught it now, but this, she's down two rounds to none. She needs to make space and let the hands go. There's not a whole lot of room in here for the duo. And this is the other fear, is that you don't want to be reversed. You should have made the space and let the hands go. She needs a finish in this round. Total strikes landed, a big edge for Mohan Nakina, who now in top position, but Bell controlling her posture, half butterfly hook. Amanda Bell, she's in that butterfly position, but she needs to put one foot on the hip and at least try to like escape, push the kick, push Mahat Makina back to make the space so she can get back to her feet. There's the feet on the hips and there's the space. Nicely done. Well by Mahat Nakina. Mahat Nakina defending well and now backing Bell to the fence. Bell looking to spin out. And side control for Mahat Nakina. She was all the way out. She lost her balance and fell in a horrible position in this position here. Under two minutes left in the fight, and Marina Mahatnakina, who had the edge in the stand-up, now looking to take advantage of this dominant position. And this, to me, is where I thought the whole fight would be for yes, Maria. Yes, Bell talked about she it as well. She did a great job of keeping it on the feet, landing her kicks and her strikes. Now that she's on top, and Amanda Bell's going to have a hard time getting her off of her. 
Bell getting the underhook. Now she's starting to work herself back out. At least trying to work herself back into a full guard position. Ground and pound from Mahatlantina's Bell fishing for a submission from back, looking to scramble. Now in north-south position, the sprawl by Mahatlantina. Mahatlantina at under a minute left in the fight. Good situational awareness by Mahatnakina in terms of her positioning jumps. Well, it's, I call that a, f a good fight IQ. What she did is she never tried to chase something, though, and left herself out of position. She kept, made sure that she sprawled on top of Amanda Bell, made her carry her weight, and when she couldn't get there, she went back to making space and then stepped into the body lock. Nice job. As we come to the final 30 seconds of this female featherweight fight here during the Bellator 260 prelims, both Amanda Bell and Marina Mohatnakina looking to get back in the win column. An important fight for their respective careers as we are in the final 10 seconds. A scrappy, gritty affair between Bell and Maha Nakina. What did you think of uh, this fight? Josh between uh, Marina Mahatnakana and Amanda Bell. I thought it was a great performance, Marina. Marina, it was what she needed was she needed this. Coming in against a number eight opponent, getting that win that solidifies her and you, at least being in the top ten. You think she's getting the win. We've gone to the scorecards, Josh. You know, <laughs> you know better than that, sir. Yes, yes, yes. I understand this. But I don't see how she lost this fight. She dominated positions. The third round was probably the closest, but I gave Marina all three rounds. And you mentioned the evolving, uh, the fight IQ continuing to improve. And, and there may be the biggest takeaway of, of one of the positives of being away for so long. We did see a different fighter and a better fighter in Marina Mahanakina. Yeah, we saw a way better fighter in terms of just learning how to use the, the cage uh, recognition. She could move around, circle around. It was the footwork, I thought, that really dictated the pace of this fight. So she was able to land the clean shots and then circled out. And when she couldn't circle out, you can see that she, in the scramble, when she couldn't circle out, she got to the top position. And when she got to the top position, she was hard to get off. Very good performance by Marina Makina. You can see this takedown. She has the underhook. She raised the underhook high that she knee picked, got to the top position in there as well in that third round. Amanda Bell came in ranked at number eight in the Bellator MMA female featherweight division. Marina Mahanakina would love to crash the top 10 party. With the official decision, here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your three judges at cage side. All three, Dave Hagen, Dave Torelli, Marcel Varela, all seen exactly the same. 30 to 27 for the winner by unanimous decision. Marina Mahanakina. Overcome with emotion after having just authored the biggest oh. victory of her career. Yeah. And oh, yeah, what a relief it is, snapping a two-fight losing streak. Yeah. <laughs> Marina Mahanakina. With a clean sweep on the judges' scorecards, knocking off the veteran Amanda Bell as Marina Mahanatkina picks up her first victory under the Bellator MMA banner, and the winner is standing by with Josh Thompson. Ladies and gentlemen, here with Marina Mahanatkina. Great performance.
over Mandibel, the number eight ranked fighter. Tell me what you're feeling right now. Я очень долго ждала этого боя, потому что я два года уже не дралась, и сегодня была задача выйти на этот бой как на праздник. И мне действительно хотелось подраться все три раунда, насладиться этой атмосферой октагона. Не хотелось торопиться, поэтому я двигалась сегодня по октагону словно в танце. Uh, I wanted to enjoy my fight. I haven't fought in two years, so I've been waiting a good amount of time for this. And I just wanted to enjoy it, go in there, have fun, and just have fun as much as I can. Well, the last time you fought, okay, it's been two years, like you, like you said. But then coming back, you look like a completely different fighter. Not just the grappling, but the wrestling and the movement, as well as your stand-up. Talk to me what your improvements have been and how you went through it these last two years. Two years ago, it was a completely different fight. What did you change in your preparation for the fight? I finished my lover's career in Samba. I used to mix my lover's career and the fight. And there was no opportunity to prepare for the fight. But at the same time, during the pandemic, захотела определиться в чем-то одном и хочу себя заявить в смешанных единоборствах, показать, что такое русская самба. И совершенству нет предела, это только начало. У меня грандиозные планы в этом направлении. Uh, I was working on my sambo, sambo, uh, and I'm planning on making a statement in the Bellator and my mixed martial arts career. And this is not the end. I'm planning on making a huge comeback and making a lot of noise in Bellator. That was a big win over the number eight, Amanda Bell. Congratulations, Marina Mahakantina. A belated birthday present, a belated 33-year birthday gift for Marina Mahanakina, who turns in her best performance and picks up her first win in Bellator MMA female featherweight division. Another impressive performance out of the Sanford MMA team as we go back to the fight desk. Here's Jen Brown. Well, thanks, Mara. That is a big birthday present to uh, celebrate there after a two-year layoff. you got to wonder where she will stand in the rankings when those come out in that featherweight division after knocking off the number eight ranked bell. All right. We've got uh, some great fights coming your way. Four in our main card coming up later tonight on Showtime. Let's talk about the second fight of the night, though. We've got Aaron Pico. He comes in. He's on a hot streak. He's riding a three-fight win streak. He's taken on a dangerous opponent in Aiden Lee. Now, John, when we've talked to Pico, we, you know, in these last few meetings, you can kind of see a difference in him, right? It's his mindset you know we've seen it in his performance in the cage as well he says it's time but there's more to that story than just time for Aaron Pico I am looking forward to this fight so much and it's because of what has happened to Aaron Pico Aaron Pico has always been a world-class athlete you know since he's been into his teens look he was phenomenal as far as his wrestling he was a golden glove boxer but he was not a mixed martial artist and he could not combine that together and michael you know what it's like to have great skill sets but when you step in the cage it's all about bringing all those skill sets together in the transitions that's the difference now of aaron pico 100 percent my 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 coach the after my first fight he said you're going to spend the rest of the time when you're back in the gym and it's because my stand-up is was great it's quality but i need to learn everything else that goes along with being a mixed martial artist and that is what aaron pico needs to do as well and you can see in these highlights right here this is what is making aaron pico good this is against solo hatley jr it was a beautiful display he never got hurt against john de jesus took his time a huge right hand finishes him off it is his patience it, it is his ability to have a rhythm in the fight now where he's not pressing all the time. He's a completely different fighter. You know, when I saw these two at the weigh-ins yesterday, there's a noticeable size difference that Aiden Lee has on Aaron Pico. Michael, I know that's something yeah. that you are used to fighting with. <laughs> How can that play to his favor? How can he use that against a dangerous striker and wrestler in Aaron Pico? Well, I feel in this fight, Aaron Pico is going to have to utilize his wrestling to kind of close that gap. But if Aiden Lee is able to maintain a solid distance and use the kick height like high kick keep his hands up it'll be easier to defend the takedown or the shots that are coming in so it's going to be a lot easier for him and he's got a, i've seen him he's southpaw as well it makes it slightly harder solid long jabs you know he's finished his last fight with a, uh, with a high head kick it's, he's got all the right attributes there but can he do it 
It is the question because Aiden Lee is a fantastic athlete. He is fast, he is explosive in his movements, and he's got a very good submission game. The real question that I have is, he's talking about actually out wrestling Aaron Pico. He's talking about t taking Aaron Pico down, and I look at that and I go, what are you thinking? Yeah. Don't play another man's game. It's not the way to get the win. Be that guy that uses that length, uses that explosiveness, and hurt him from afar. So many people like to come in and prove themselves, unnecessarily so. I don't go in there, I do a lot of wrestling and a lot of jiu-jitsu, but I don't go, I come here to prove my wrestling to people and prove my jiu-jitsu to people. I come here to fight and be me, the, the most, the best version of me, and that's standing, standing up. And it's going to be the same here with, with Aiden Lee. Use your long strikes, use your kicks, keep him at distance, and win through knocking, knocking him out, maybe. That's the only way I'm going to see him taking him down. <laughs> I like what you're saying, both of them. Knock Knock down, knockdowns are good takedowns. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a right. good takedown. They do work. All right, well, this is going to be an exciting matchup, and for more on this, you can versus USA matchup. We're going to head over to London where Bellator's own Gareth A. Davies has a report. Aaron Pico and Aiden Lee meet tonight in what promises to be an explosive featherweight battle. Lee, who trains at Team Renegade in Birmingham alongside brothers Leon and Fabian Edwards, favours the strike, stun and submit style of combat and will be looking to make a name for himself on his debut here on US soil. He does indeed face a name in number six rank Pico. Lee told me this week, it's time I got these types of fights. There's a lot of eyes on him. So when I smash him, all eyes will be on me. That's a big call from Lee. Pico, meanwhile, raised like a Spartan from the age of seven with a regimen of wrestling, boxing, and pancration, was hailed as a future champion even before he turned professional. Explosive, not into overtime, he's left a destructive trail which has seen six of his seven wins end in the first round. He's not invulnerable, however, having been stopped himself three times. Can the Midlander Lee prove he belongs in the big time and assign Pico a fourth defeat? Get the jungle clearing ready for some beautiful brutality. From the London skyline to the picturesque skyline here at the Mohegan Sun in Uncasville, Connecticut, as we get set for action, it will be contested at a contract weight of 150 pounds. Second generation mixed martial artist Lucas Brennan will battle Matt Skibicki. And now set to make his way to the cage, Matt Skibicki. Twenty-six-year-old Matt Skavicki making his Bellator MMA debut and hoping to not only pick up a victory here in his first fight in Bellator, but hoping to stop the bleeding, Josh. He has lost three in a row, and he is looking to seize the opportunity here tonight, knowing that this could be make or break. For this he, fighter. He's got his hands full, though, against Lucas Brennan, and Brennan comes from a family of just good grapplers and good fighters. But I gotta tell you, Matt's got the chance, the opportunity to get back on the winning track, but he's good all the way around. He's just gotta start fighting a little bit smarter. Those losses only came because some of the times he was a fight smart, and that's, that's to be expected from young fighters. Yeah, he started his career with four consecutive wins, and now will look to right the ship here in his first foray inside the Bellator MMA cage. And now set to make his way, Lucas Skywalker. I mentioned that he's a second generation mixed martial artist. His father, Chris, was in the first Pride FC fight I ever called at Bushido 1, October 2003, at the Saitama Super Arena in Japan. His father picked up the submission win that night, as you did in your lone Pride FC fight, which, by the way, took place in July 2005. I'm not getting old. Yes, you're getting old. I'm going to age myself. We're all getting old. He just turned 21. Lucas Brennan. Yeah, I'm going to age myself. Month. I was supposed to fight his father three or four times. <laughs> what, what you can see from him, though, 
against Lopez is he gets to the back, he controls the position, he gets underneath the chin and finishes. This kid is a finisher, and that's the one thing I love about him, is that he's somebody, once he gets on top of you or he gets to your back, he finds ways to finish it. He has the gable grip choke here, and he gets to the back and does it again. Now he's lassoed his arm all the way through, and he sits up big elbows for such a young man. Sometimes younger kids will try to just touch, 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 and make the rest stop. No, he was laying down heavy elbows that led into the bigger shots and got the TKO stoppage. At 4-0, thus far, the MMA force has been with Luca Skywalker Brennan as he will welcome Matt Skibicki to Bellator MMA. And again, this fight will take place at a contract weight of 150 pounds. What numbers stick out to you, Josh? The age is four years younger, and he's so mature, though, for being four years. Comes from the lineage with his father. Good stuff. I wasn't good at math either. He's five years younger as we go to Michael C. Williams. <laughs> those joining us tonight late night from the uk we thank you for joining us on bbc i player here at the bellator 260 prelims we go now to a contract weight fight at 150 pounds set for three five minute rounds introducing the blue corner at five foot eight weighing in 146 pounds even his professional record four and three from lexington park maryland presenting Matt and across the cage is adversary out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 146 and one half pounds. As a professional, he's undefeated. Four victories, no defeats from Frisco, Texas. Introducing Lucas Skywalker Brennan. And the referee in charge, Brian Miner. Brian Miner has been assigned this fight between Lucas Brennan, undefeated at four and zero. Oh. You ready? You ready? Matt Skibicki four and three. Brennan in the red gloves, Skibicki in the blue gloves. Did we get an abacus for my broadcast partner, Josh? This is round number one, scheduled for three, brother. What do you look for early in this one, JT? Six minus one, I'm trying to figure it out still. <laughs> oh man. Look for Lucas, he's just gonna just be patient. Don't overcommit with the strikes, work his way into the takedown and get to the top position. Both of them are very good wrestlers, so it's gonna be kind of a, they may end up being one of those wrestlers cancel out each other and they may have to stand. Good for us. A lot of feints, a lot of movement back and forth, looking to establish dominance in the center of the cage. Opening minute. There's a calf kick delivered by Skibicki. As Brennan fights from the southpaw stance. Lucas just rolled his ankle a little bit. I saw him hop around on the second. Ooh, nice body oh, kick over by Lucas. And Lucas Brennan looking for that guillotine. His partner was famous looking for that guillotine. And Darcy's in. Nice choke here attempt by Brennan. Doesn't have that arm all the way across, but he's looking to roll. Now he uses his right leg, probably to step over and hook. He's trying to readjust it to make it a little bit tighter. He can also take his right knee and push Skibiki's elbow down to make the arm go all the way across. That's all tight, though. Great finish by Lucas Brennan. Just 21 years of age, Lucas Brennan bests Matt Skibiki with a first round Darce choke. He now has a forearm choke, a rear naked choke, One, five, and four. now a Darce choke on a resume that continues to build, and obviously the apple does not fall far from the tree as uh, Papa Chris Brennan has to be very proud of what he saw here tonight. Yeah, but Skibiki made a big mistake. What happened was Lucas Brennan hit him with the body kick, and then Brennan jumped in, and he, Skibiki jumped in on him, and when he did that, beautiful body kick there. Then Skibiki went to the body lock, which led him right into the chin, and then that transition
position was right into that Dars. And then as, he, as they're scrambling around, Lucas is trying to make it tighter and tighter as he goes. He's not quite able to get it, but he keeps making the adjustments and eventually gets the submission. Nicely done by such a young man. It's only fitting that on a day where I went back and forth with Big John McCarthy watching Dars chokes and Anaconda chokes over and over again, trying to spot that difference. Of course, there's a big one. It would only be fitting that we see a textbook Dars choke here tonight from Lucas Brennan, a youngster on the rise in Bellator. Tour MMA. Well, his dad was famous for having some of the best guillotines in the business or getting to your back and choking you out. And so it was, it's no surprise that he's really good on the neck. Brazilian top teams Milton Vieira created the Anaconda choke. I was exposed to it via Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira in Pride Fighting Championships. And despite Big John McCarthy's tutorial, it continues here tonight. Let's make it official with Michael C. Williams. Inside the Bellator cage, the Anaconda choke ends it with a tap official time, one minute, 54 seconds round, number one by submission. He's still undefeated, Lucas Skywalker Brennan. If the former Strike Force lightweight champion didn't get it, I'm going to give myself a mulligan. In any event, Lucas Brennan with an impressive submission win here via Anaconda Choke. He is standing by with Josh Thompson. Ladies and gentlemen, here with Lucas Brennan. Hey, nice transition. He went right off the body kick. Skippy, he came in on the body lock. He jumped right on the neck. Walk me through the rest of it. Man, I, uh, I I live in that position, that front headlock position, you know, uh, like for forever. That's that's what I love, and so uh, I thought I was gonna get slammed pretty hard out of there, but you know, I, I got my hands together. I knew it was wraps. I uh, I just had to get the adjustment in, and um, yeah, man, I just I was able to lock up my anaconda. I'm happy. My next question will be: Is where did you get it from? What's that? Where did you get that submission from? <laughs> <laughs> From uh, your dad. Your dad's my, obviously my been father, famous for getting yes, on sir. the net, getting on the head from his years of fighting. And I'm, I'm just leading you into that conversation. Man, uh, you know, I obviously leech a lot of my information off of him. You know, that's, that's a great source uh, for my chokes and for, for all my submission games and like that. But uh, he's definitely more of an arm guy. Uh, you know, me, my brother, I've been working a lot off of that position, that anaconda position, uh, that assassin choke, Dars choke, that whole position there. And so uh, I was just happy I was able to, to fit it in. Dominant performance tonight, still a young fighter. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Lucas Brennan. Hey, at least we got a Darce choke out of Lucas Brennan as he uh, picks up an impressive vi a win here. Hey, Jen Brown, tell Big John McCarthy that he can put both uh, Just Thompson and yours truly in Anaconda Choke. We can finally figure out the difference. That's right, Mauro. Uh, have a little chat here with John McCarthy. He's not going to do that to us up here, though, for sure. Uh, let's talk about that, John. Uh, you're not with Michael up here. That's right. Let's talk about that, John, though. Uh, let's talk about what Lucas was able to do and hold on, you know, in those transitions, not let go of that choke and to get it tighter and tighter and how impressive that was. Yeah, one of the things that you really have to be impressed with with Lucas is he's so good at the grappling. Yes. He's been doing it his entire life. And if you look at the little transitions he makes, he knows that he has it tight, but he knows a guy is not going to just give up and tap out here. You've got to create that specific pressure that makes them feel like I am going unconscious. And he does that with his movements. You see him try to trap the leg here. He just misses it. You see him coming up on top and then goes back and turns his body back into it to get to the, his side. And you see that pressure coming. There it is right there. All that drive of that shoulder and everything down, that creates that pressure. It was a beautiful job by a technician in the submission game.
And you know a little something about his dad, though. You were sitting, he was sitting up here telling us his dad, Chris. So you, you go way back with him. Well, you're talking about Chris. Chris and I met back in the Gracie Academy back in I think, 1992 is when he started. Came in with a guy named Jeremy Williams. Both became great fighters. And Chris has just been an incredible proponent of the martial arts. Has been a guy that is a great coach. And you can see what he's done with his son. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, he moves to 5-0 and inside the Bellator cage. you got to imagine if he is knocking on the uh, featherweight uh, top 10 rankings there in Bellator. Well, speaking of rankings, let's take a look here at our welterweight rankings because when you look at this list, it is crystal clear why the number one ranked Yaroslav Amosov is the challenger in the challenger position for tonight's welterweight title. He's boasting that 25-0 record, including 19 stoppages. Well, he faces the three-time welterweight champion, Douglas Lima, and he feels that it is his experience at the top that gives him the edge. Becoming a champion is hard, but it's even harder to stay champion. Just being able to overcome all the hardships, injuries, you know, losses. I'm not here looking for easy fight. I fought the biggest names. I've been to the top three times. But uh, October 26, 2019, man, what a special day. Probably the most important day of my fighting career. Rematch, champion again, tournament champion. We got gold on me, confetti, and I took home $1 million. The belt belongs once again to Douglas Lima. That's life changing. You know, I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget it. That was the biggest payday that I've ever had in my career. You know, I love the fight game, but I love my family even more. You know, and there's nothing better, you know, to go on vacation, take him to a beach, take him to a different country after I win a fight. There's nothing like family. My name is uh, Yaroslav Amosov. I am number one in welterweight in the world. I have 25 uh, wins and no losses. I won 26 and 0. He's a very special guy and very soft-spoken, as humble as can be, but complete monster. One of the most skillful athletes that I've seen. As of right now, he has the best record in MMA, 25 and 0. It's impressive. Graphic 0 in поражении. I can't say it. I think we need to train and believe in ourselves. I think the main thing is to believe in ourselves and I fought, you know, and defeated guy before. You know, we all know what happened. Michael Venom Page looking to remain undefeated. Douglas Lima wanting another crack at becoming welterweight champion. To stay undefeated in this sport, it's difficult. You know, I don't care who you fought, it's hard. But it's also hard, you know, getting this belt back three times. So it doesn't matter if he's 100 and 0. You know, when he steps in that cage, if you're there against me, it's 0-0. Zero, zero. In impressive fashion! Masov, you know, his game, he's never lost, but yeah, it's the first time he's training for a five-rounder. It's not as easy as people think. You know, we're gonna find out how real, you know, 25 and 0 is. Anybody can fight hard and win a fight in two minutes, but, you know, the real super studs can do it 15, 25 minutes. And this guy can do it 25 minutes hard. He's got that mentality, he'd rather die than lose. I was ready to fight, I was prepared, and our team is working. So, I understand that Douglas Lima is also working. Yes, I have 25 wins, I didn't win, I don't want to do that. It's one thing to be undefeated, but it's another to be a world champion. Sitting at that throne, holding that gold, you know, it just means a lot to me. Emosov hasn't fought anybody like me. I gotta put this guy out no matter what, you know. He's trying to take away from me a dream that I achieved. Expect fireworks, because I'm coming to finish this guy. And the belt is staying around my waist. There will be a new Volterweight champion. It's me, Jaroslav Emosov. There I'm fighting for my family, but nothing beats the aftermath, you know get a win, make a little bit of money, take my family out, play with my kids, and that's what I plan on doing after I beat Amosov.
Well, Lima says that it's his family that he fights for. He wants to work hard to provide for them. Uh, having covered him for the last five years now, I have to say he is probably the nicest, most humble fighter uh, I've ever covered in this sport. Uh, but, John, uh, on the flip side, he's also an absolute destroyer in the cage. Oh, there's no doubt he's a destroyer. That's why he's the champion. But when you become mature in this sport, and you understand who you are as a fighter. You don't have to act like a bad guy all the time. You don't have to act like a tough guy. You are tough, you prove it in the cage, that's all you need to do. You've been in there with this guy. You know exactly what he brings, but you guys actually had a very good relationship even though you were gonna fight. You know, I'm used to that because uh, in the kickboxing world, I travel around with people over and over again. And some of the people that I fought against for years are some of my closest friends now. So, and it's different here. It doesn't feel quite the same. Everyone feels like they need to put on that kind of facade. But with him, he, like you say, he understands that, no, we, we prove it when we get into the cage. And that's where it, that's where it's the most important. Well, they say action speaks louder than words. And that's uh, always true when you step in the cage. <laughs> All right, well, that is our main event. Coming up tonight, Showtime 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, with three other great matchups. Now, going to head back down cage side, Mo. All right, Jen, try, uh, time to add words to the actions of Nick Newell and uh, Bobby King. These lightweights are about to go at it here on the Bellator 260 prelims. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Bobby King. Well, Bobby King knows he's entering the danger zone when it comes to the Bellator MMA cage. The 37-year-old with a record of 9-3 and three, about to fight for the first time under the bright lights of Bellator MMA. For fans who have yet to see him compete, what stands out for you, Josh, when it comes to Bobby King? Well, he's well-rounded. He goes everywhere. He likes to stand and bang, but he, he also sometimes will leave himself out of position on the feet. Also, he does not want to get this take. He, he is good at wrestler. He does not want to get into the takedown position as well with Nick Newell because Nick Newell is a beast when it comes to getting on the neck. You got a cup on, right? Riding a lot of momentum as one three straight, including an arm bar submission in his last fight against MMA vet Steven Seiler to earn the right to compete here in this circle of truth, the Bellator MMA cage, Bobby King. And this is Connecticut's own notorious Nick Newell. Did I mention how much we have all missed that sound, the sound of an audience, and yes, limited capacity here tonight at the Mohegan Sun Arena, but many of them here are to here to support Connecticut's Nick Newell. An overall record of 16 and three, trying to bounce back from his first loss here in the Bellator MMA cage, and his story has been well-documented, an inspirational human being who was born with congenital amputation of his left arm, which ends just below his elbow, but man, he puts the ability and disability and then some junk. Yeah, but you know what, though? I'm not gonna even talk about that. What I'm gonna talk about is his fight skills. He's good. Yes, he he's is. very good, and he's good on getting on the neck, and he knows how to use all weapons, from the kicks to the chokes to the submissions, his wrestling, everything. He's a fantastic fighter. 11 of 16 wins have come due to his slick submission game. He wrestled in college for Western New England, and he's actually one of the very few wrestlers to have won matches at six different weight classes. And so, Nick Newell continuing to live his MMA dream and hoping to give the hometown crowd something to cheer about. Josh, take us through the tail of the tape for this matchup. Yeah, I think what you're gonna see here in the difference is, is that Nick Newell's got 16 wins and Bobby King has nine. A little bit more of the experience and when it comes to the higher level of competition, Nick Newell, Nick Newell has faced that competition. Here's Michael C. Williams. Tonight's Bellator 260 prelims continue now with a feature fight set for three five-minute rounds in the lightweight division. 
Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 156 pounds even. His professional record, nine wins, three losses. He fights out of Leighton, Utah, by way of Lahaina, Maui, Hawaii. Please welcome Bobby King. And across the cage is adversary fighting out of the red corner at five foot ten, weighing in 156 pounds as a professional. 16 victories, three defeats, hailing from Milford, Connecticut, introducing the notorious Ned Newell. And the referee in charge, Dan Bergliata. Dan Mergliata, the referee for this matchup inside the Bellator MMA cage at lightweight. Nick Newell. All right, you ready, sir? Bobby ready, sir. King. Go, the bell in round one. Newell, the red glove, while Bobby King is in the blue gloves. And Bobby King, a professional fire knife dancer, once toured with Cirque du Soleil, so obviously very athletic, flexible, but now flying his wares inside the MMA cage, and he already eats a shot from Newell. Newell likes to get things to Sorry, Josh Dunn early. All 13 of his wins via knockout or submission have come in the opening round. Yeah, the thing with Nick Newell, though, is that he has ways of doing things that other fighters don't. And so what he'll do is he'll switch stance to make his, his jab hand, a power hand, to throw the overhand. So he mixes up his combinations from the kicks along with the body kicks and the inside leg kick and then coming off with the combination with his hand. Yeah, he told us he feels he's better at blending all aspects of mixed martial arts together than most fighters are, and in the early going, bringing the fight to Bobby King as we pass the opening minute of this first round. King tags Newell upstairs with the short right. Shot there by Bobby King. There's a shot by Newell securing the single and then scoops up both legs and seats Bobby King to the mat. He's gonna look to gather the legs and figure for them. He can do that and then turn Bobby King's back off the fence. The key in this position for most fighters is to try and turn their back off the fence, put their back flat to the ground, start working your body up their body to get to the top position. Newell told us that for this fight camp, he, he delegated more than usual. Added a new conditioning program that's a lot more scientific than anything he's done in the past. There you go, he's starting to put his back flat to the canvas. He's going to start walking his legs more towards the cage, which will actually slide Bobby King's back off that fence as well. Both athletes known for their finishing technique. Seven of King's nine wins have come inside the distance, including two knockouts, as he tries to slip out. Trying to get back to his feet, he's able to pop back up. Good job by Bobby King. As soon as he escaped the grips and his hips came clear, he was able to get up to, to his butt. Under two minutes remaining in the first round. Head position, Bobby. There we go. King working. That wizard delivers the right knee to the midsection. Trying to create separation, but pinned up along the fence. Newell changes level, but eats a ha hammer fist from King, and King doing a good job of defending. Yeah, he's doing a good job with defending. His back is still against the fence. He's got to look to make that space and then get out. Good job with the knee there as well. Under a minute and a half remaining in the opening round. Watch for the reset. 
What, what's keeping Nick Newell in this position? He's got the higher underhook. So now he's got the double under double underhook right now. So he's just trying to try drop down on the body lock. Yeah, able to create separation, disengages, and now resets. Walking down, Newell hits him with a right. Under a minute left in the first round. Newell lunging forward with that lead right hook. Thirty seconds left in the opening round. Newell attempts a kick. Doesn't find its mark. Is more of a feeling out process, a tactical opening round. Just a few seconds left in the first round. So a electric display of striking there in the final few seconds of the first frame. And coming up Friday, June 25th, the number one heavyweight in the Bellator MMA rankings, Tim Johnson, takes on the 10 and 1 Team Fedor standout, Valentin Moldovsky. The heavyweight interim title on the line Friday, June 25th, Bellator MMA on Showtime. A little sip of water. All right, so we got to get that jab to the chest when he's sitting there, okay? Now, if he's sitting in front of you but not, not doing anything, get some level changes and then reset. You don't need you don't need to be the guy who engages all the time. But let's not back straight up, all right? You're doing a great job. Okay, mouthpiece in. The bell in round two, Josh, and not scoring the fight, obviously, but who would you rather have been in that opening five minutes? Well, I thought Nick Newell was dominating the majority of the round, but I thought Bobby King did the most damage at the end of the round, so I probably would have to give it to Bobby King. King was looking to crown Newell in the final seconds of the first, and now a more aggressive start by both fighters here in round two. Push kick by King to the breadbasket of Newell. Nice little toe kick right there by Bobby King, right to the bread basket. King switches to a southpaw stance before going back to orthodox. So I'm an uptick in the offensive output of Bobby King here to start the second stanza. Yeah, Bobby King switched, though, to the southpaw because if you look at the inside of his left leg, it's pretty tore up. Oh, and he came in with that lead slashing elbow as Newell changed levels momentarily, backs King up to the fence again. This is where Nick needs to be to kind of keep the fight until he can drop down and try and get that takedown. Bobby King's doing a great job of defending this. There you see him drop down. Use the circle off that fence and really cover his head with his hips. 90 seconds gone here in round number two. King trying to frame out, create some separation to deliver those knees to the midsection. This is that battle of position with the head. So what you want is Nick Newell to put his forehead underneath Bobby King's chin and hold him there. Or you want to take one in the cup. <laughs> That's the second one, by the way. Nick Newell takes one in the family jewels. Here in the second round. Nope. You want the same spot? Yep. Against the cage. Oh, I like that. He was very. He, he was making sure that he didn't start standing between two uh, stand up positions. He wants to be back in the same right, position. Ready? Time keeper, time. A lot of times when the foul happens, the ref will put them back standing unless it's like on the ground. 
Under three minutes left here in the second round. And Battle for position. Newell changing levels once to secure the single, trying to take Bobby King down. Again, that kick to the midsection, jumping knee strike just as Newell was going for the takedown jump. Yeah, he let him right in the ground back there, but look, look, he can't afford to sit in this position. He's got to circle around towards the backside or stand up with the legs so he's not getting hit. This is a grimy, dirty fight, and that's exactly what you need to do to win this fight. Dane again finding success from the southpaw stance, then to orthodox body kick, and Newell continues to search for the takedown. Under two minutes left in the second round. There was a little bit of a shot in there. They got uh, Nick Newell's body. You can see him step back and take a real deep breath. Backed up by the striking of Bobby King, who was varying his attack, going to the body, then upstairs. Calf kick by Newell, but he was knocked off balance by King. Nick is slowing down a little bit. He's having a hard time keeping his hands up because he's been trying to do so much of the wrestling. Nice combination there. He went to the body on the right side, came on top of the left side. Tell if those body shots are having an effect on him because now he's going to Bobby King's body. Yeah, Normally, stiff jab. Yeah, when someone hits you to the body hard, you got to go back to their body and let them know, hey, stop hitting me in the body or I'm going to hit you. Here in round two, Bobby King landing almost 20 more strikes than Nick Newell lands that left hand, ducks underneath. There's a guillotine. And there it is. Newell looking for the guillotine. Smith pops his, make that King pops his head out with 50 seconds left in the second. And Nick is really good when he gets on that neck. I think the sweat got him out of that, got Bobby King out of there. Seconds remaining in the round as King connects with a left hand to the face of Newell. He's slowing down right now. He's Dane left and again looking for that guillotine. You hear the crowd going crazy. Connecticut's own Nick Newell looking for his 12th submission win. Again, King able to pop his head out and looking to pop. Newell in the head with an elbow strike and punches as we go to the third and final round. Oh, please out. A little bit of water, spit it out, please. Hey, you're doing good. Listen, I need you not to lunge anymore, okay? Look, Bobby, I know we're tired, too, because well, this happens, right? I like the body work. I want you just to motherfucking fight. One full cross. You're going to see Bobby King step in. He checks the kick, throws the right, the right hand off that southpaw position, doubles it up, falls back in right, right from that position as well. Gets in close. He wants to stay outside of the kicking range. Nick Noel throws a lazy kick. Doesn't... Doesn't think that Bobby King's gonna step in and was able to step in and throw a lot and land a nice combination. Nick on the neck. This is where he needs to bro, Bobby King needs to be careful because Nick Newell is dangerous on the neck. Gotta keep his head above the those uh those grips. Final round, you ready? Final round, Nick. Let's go. Third and final round. And this a matchup. In the Bellator MMA lightweight division, Nick Newell in the red glove, Bobby King in the blue gloves. King in his Bellator MMA debut. Newell hoping to move to two and one here in Bellator. Bounce back from the loss as he got hit there as they exchange to open up round three. It's been those push kicks and toe kicks to Nick Newell's body that's really made him hesitant to come forward as well as it's slowing him down quite a bit. Hey, 
Drop kick by Nick Newell. Four minutes left in the fight. Whatever is left in their respective tanks, it's time to empty it right here, right now. Well, you can see the toe marks on Nick Newell's stomach from those push kicks. You see a couple of the scrapes also, like the toenails got up in there. That's another mistake by Nick Newell. You cannot afford to throw the kick and then leave your body out of position. You have to throw it and get back to your position. Newell closes the distance. Pins King up along the fence as King looks to find a way out. Newell backs away and eats the kick from King. And Newell is not returning fire. Yeah, he's slowing down quite a bit because he had right around exchange left as well. Hook. He took another body toe kick. Yeah, lead left hook landed for King. Newell avoided that one and again closes the distance, misses with the head kick. Nice little sneaky yeah. elbow that Bobby exactly. King just threw in there. And again. Ooh, nice knee and elbow right there by Nick Newell. Through the knee and off the break through the elbow. Newell moving to his left. That alley of the right hand, but again closes the distance, but eats a knee to the midsection as he pushes King back and Newell just looking for the takedown as the seconds tick away here in the third and final round. Bobby King, up until that first takedown in the very first round, he's been able to stuff yes, he has. the takedown. And you wonder, turn, turn, turn. then Newell needs to make adjustments. Yep. And here's the thing, the first round could have went to Nick, so it really comes down to if this round is, whoever wins this round could win the fight. Under two minutes left, you will look again tenacious in his pursuit of the takedown. But he continues to be stifled by Bobby King. But you can see the exhaustion after not getting the takedown. He right. comes out, he's a little bit slower with this combination. Nice lead right hook there by Newell that connected upstairs. That time Newell caught the kick of King. King on one leg has taken off his feet. Much to the delight of this Connecticut crowd. Beautiful job of catching the kick, elevating the kick, and then making Bobby King jump and then foot sweep it off of that position. Kendall feeding Newell with a steady diet of left hands to the head now in the close guard with a minute 11 left in the fight. This is where Nick needs to get busy because I would feel, I feel he's lost the first two, two and a half minutes of this round. He needs to turn Bobby King's back off the fence and he'll hold him down. Last time Nick Newell took it out, tonight he's trying to bounce back, but Bobby King hopes to increase his win streak to four in his Bellator MMA debut with 45 seconds left in this lightweight encounter. Now Newell on his back momentarily. He tried to roll him all the way through to come up on the single leg so he get to the finish. And Bobby King feeding him a steady diet of left hands, pinning Newell to the back, uh, to the fence. Nice body kick out of that exchange, though, by Nick Newell. A gutsy effort by both Nick Newell and Bobby King. Final 15 seconds. Spirited effort from both combatants. Bobby King looking to secure his first victory under the Bellator MMA banner, coming in with three consecutive wins. Thank you, Sensei. While Nick Newell looking to bounce back after he had his three fight win streak snapped in his last fight against Manny Murrow. That was a split decision at Bellator 232 way back in October 2019. So Newell 
has been on the shelf for a while as well due to a variety of factors, including COVID. Yeah, that inside leg kick by Nick Newell is what actually made Bobby King switch to the southpaw stance. And then Bobby King, though, was the key for him tonight was mixing up his strikes. He went from throwing the inside leg kick to the spinning kick to the push kick and toe kick up the middle and then mixing that up with his hands. As the fight went on, Nick Newell had a hard time getting the takedowns. And you saw that was in the last round, but he wasn't able to do anything with it. So when it came down to it, the takedowns only two, but he exerted a lot of energy trying to get them. And the strikes and the kicks landed were definitely to Bobby King, 18 and 70. That's a lot of strikes and kicks landed, though throughout the fight they were unanswered by Nick Newell. Seven years of age, taking on the 35-year-old Nick Newell. The judges have tabulated their scores. And the winner's name is about to come out of the mouth of Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go now to your judges at cage side. Your first judge, Dave Hagen, scores the fight 30 to 27. He sees the fight for King. Your second judge, Dave Turelli, scores the fight 29-28. He sees the fight for Newell. Your third and final judge at cage side, Mike Murtha, scores the fight 30 to 27 for the winner by split decision, Bobby. the victory here in his Bellator MMA debut. He's now won four straight. Meanwhile, Nick Newell suffers his second consecutive split decision setback, much to the chagrin of his, well, his hometown faithful, his state faithful. As we go to Josh Thompson, who will speak to the winner, Bobby King. Bobby, I'm here with you. You're fighting in front of Nick Newell's kind of home crowd. Tell me what kind of energy you had to possess to come in here and get that win tonight. Uh, just another day. This is what we do. Came out here, hard at least sparring. I was honored to fight Nick. He made me a better uh, fighter. I knew he wasn't going to come out here and just let me come out in front of his crowd and beat him. And I appreciate him making me better. What about him made you fight harder or train differently for him? Obviously, he's had uh, one less on than I do, right? So he's been here. Um, he's a badass wrestler. And I know he's a top elite fighter. So that alone, nothing else. He's just a badass. Your combinations were, is what really I felt like made the difference. The push kick up the middle, that toe kick had a lot of effect, and then you mixed that up behind your combinations uh, with your hands. Talk to me about, like, was that the game plan coming in, or were you looking to get some takedowns, and how did you mix it up? We just uh, came out here to flow. Nothing more, nothing less. Came out here, read what was happening. We knew his weaknesses and his strengths, and we, we uh, didn't care what he was going to do. We came out here to do what we were going to do. Well, congratulations on your win tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Bobby King. Successful Bellator MMA debut for Bobby King and a sight for sore eyes. The fans inside the Mohegan Sun Arena limited crowd here. Dwayne Bang Ludwig, an amazing fighter turned tremendous coach, of course. Trained under El, the legendary El Wapo Bas Rutin system. And Bobby King getting it done with his striking here tonight. Let's go to Jen Brown. Well, thanks, Mar. That's right. An impressive performance there by Bobby King. Moving to 10 and 3, picking up four straight wins tonight. All right, we'll catch up on past fights 24 7 now on our Bellator Pluto TV channel. No passwords, no payments. Just drop in and enjoy the show. Available now on your favorite devices. Look for us in the sports category.
Well, tonight we have a stacked fight card coming your way on Showtime. Now, the night starts with a welterweight clash between DeMarquez Jackson, Mark Leminger. John, you said their style makes for an exciting fight, so what should we expect when these two step into the cage? Well, both of their styles are come at you styles. Mark Leminger puts pressure well, so does DeMarquez Jackson. He puts a lot of pressure. They're different in the fact that DeMarquez is more striking centered while you have Leminger, who he's a wrestler, but he uses his stand up well. DeMarquez is a guy that we saw in his last fight put it all on the line. He will not quit. You love guys that fight his in his style. Talk to me about why you think that's impressive. I, I, I'll tell you something now. If I'm if I'm going to war, the Marquez is the person I'd want on my right side because he's he's going out on his shield. He's making sure he's leaving everything in the cage. But I can't take anything from what I've seen for, of Mark Lemina. It's it's one of those things where he can win anywhere. He's had five, I think like five TKOs, three submissions, three uh, three decisions. He, he can win in any 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 way. So it's going to be a great fight. They're both going to be in there on their front foot. Well, when we talked to Mark this week, he says that in his last few fights, he doesn't feel like he's used all of the tools in his toolbox. This fight camp, he worked on his pace, specifically his wrestling. So what improvements would you like to see from him in the cage, John? Well, you, you look at his last couple of fights. He fought Amazov and he got it got stopped on a cut. Now, Amazov, 25-0, and 0, he presents problems for everyone. But in his last fight, you look at what happened. It was that his normal output slowed down. He can't do that, especially against Jackson. He needs to come out with that fast pace, that pressure pace, and keep putting shots on Jackson so he has problems in being offensive himself. Well, you know, you talked about the heart, right? These two guys, they bite down on their mouthpiece. They like to go in and throw down when we hear that. You know what that means. But for me, it's just <laughs> it's just a great show to start, like a great yeah. fight to start on for the show. Um, for me, I think everyone should look forward to this one. Don't blink. Uh, absolutely. Don't blink. That's a great way to put it. All right. Well, uh, that kicks off our Showtime card. It's uh, our, our first fight of the night. And then in our co-main event uh, tonight, we've got Paul Semtex Daily. He's taking on Jason, the ass-kicking machine, Jackson, in a fight that promises an explosion, just like that first one. Well, for a bit of history on why this fight will feature fireworks, here's Bellator. Tours UK guide Gareth A. Davies. Yes, we might as well say it. Bellator president Scott Coker sees legendary British knockout artist Paul Daly's four-minute, 57-second war with Nick Diaz just over a decade ago as arguably the most thrilling round in the history of MMA. The 62-fight veteran Daly faces tonight the man from Kingston, Jamaica, a fighter who has shown an increasing versatility and is on a four-fight winning streak. He holds victories over Jordan Meehan, Benson Henderson, and last time out, Neiman Gracie in a bizarre fight in which Jackson caught his eye on the cage fence but went on to win, controversially in my view, by unanimous decision. This terrific matchup at a contracted 175 pounds is an old school roots and respect fight. Daly, who served, of course, in the same British Army Regiment as Prince Harry, told me this week, I'm 3-0 at 175 pounds and I'm the current champion of that division. Bellator should make the daily belt. Nice try, Paul. Expect Semtex to explode with those heavy flashing fists and kicks and for Jackson to counter, nullify and attempt to smother the wily old fighting fox. Here in London, we cannot wait for this one. Neither can we, Mr. Davies, and frankly, we can't wait for this next fight here on the prelim portion of Bellator 260. will be contested in the featherweight division. Taiwan Claxton, the number nine ranked 145 pounder, takes on the debuting Justin Gonzalez, who is 11 and 0. And now ready to make his way to the cage, the undefeated Justin, Jaytrain Ozala. The J Train has rolled into Bellator MMA. A 
11 pro fights, 11 victories, four knockouts, and one rear naked choke win for the 30-year-old Gonzalez who wrestled for the University of Northern Colorado and CSU Pueblo has a bachelor's degree in exercise science and health promotion and looking to make a big impact here in Bellator MMA, but he faces a big test in his first fight. Yeah, if he can get past Tyron Claxton, that puts him right in that top 10 rankings, and I'm going to tell you right now, he's got a great chance of doing it. He's as good, if not better, of a wrestler, and very intense, and conditioning is on point out of Colorado. At elevation, he comes in. He will push the limits throughout this whole fight. Says he has an opportunity to change his life and the lives of many others through fighting as big goals wants to inspire others so they can achieve greatness. A former champion on the regional circuit looking to, well, the upper echelon of Bellator MMA's featherweight division. And now set to make his way, Taiwan Man, as always in this bag, Taiwan Air Claxton wanting to uh, put on a show as he spits bars with J. Cole. And for Taiwan Air Claxton, coming off a split decision setback against the rising J.J. Wilson, but he feels he is still in the mix. And for you, Josh, what is what is something you need to see more out of Air Claxton in this fight to become a true believer in what he can be in Bellator? I need to see that Air Claxton, the one that made him famous, that's the leaving his feet, doing the things that was unexpected, is what got him to where he is. He got away from that a little bit in his last couple of fights, and then what happened was with J.J. Wilson is he made it just a strictly wrestling fight. Like press into the fence, not doing a lot of the work on the feet like we know yeah, we can. On, right? And yeah, that was a setback. Yeah, I thought he still kind of won the fight. I know it was a split decision, but you can't be mad when it went either way. If he makes this fun, he'll be exciting again. He went viral in his Bellator MMA debut and his pro debut. All of the fights for Taiwan Air Claxton here in Bellator MMA. He recorded that first round flying knee knockout and has gone on to author a 6-2 and two record. But again, looking to bounce back against a man who has yet to taste defeat as we go to the tail of the tape, JT. Yeah, what you're going to see here is that Taiwan Claxton has a two and a half inch reach advantage. He's got to make sure he keeps Justin Gonzalez on the end of his punches unless he's able to get on top and then rise up and land those vicious ground and pound strikes that he likes to do. With the official introductions, here is Michael C. Williams. For those fans tonight that have made, have just made their way inside Mohegan Sun Arena, it's good to have you back live here at Bellator MMA. The prelims roll on now with three five-minute rounds in the featherweight division. Introducing the blue corner at five foot nine, weighing in 145 pounds. In his Bellator debut, he brings an undefeated professional record of 11 and 0. He fights out of Greeley, Colorado. Justin J. Gonzalez. And across the cage. His adversary out of the red corner at five foot eight, weighing in 146 pounds. As a professional, six victories, two losses, fighting out of Denver, Colorado, by way of Cleveland, Ohio, Taiwan, and Claxton. In charge, your referee, Blake Grice. Blake Grice. The official assigned to oversee this a featherweight fight between Taiwan Air Claxton, who says his experience inside the ready? Bellator MMA ready? cage fight. is his greatest advantage over the debuting Justin Gonzalez, who is in the blue gloves, Claxton in the red gloves. Both of them high-level wrestlers, but both of them also love to chuck the leather. And in this sport, you have to know how to seamlessly mix it together, Josh Dawson. 
Yeah, what you're gonna see with Justin Gonzalez is he's someone who doesn't understand that losing is an option because he's undefeated. He's 11 and 0. He's someone that he feels like everything he's been doing is working. And he comes in here with the most confidence, whereas Tywan Claxton's coming in off of a loss. And so that messes with your mind a little bit. You don't want to drop two in a row. You know, whereas Gonzalez hasn't had that feeling yet. So that's gonna be a big thing, I think, mentally for both fighters. And while Gonzalez has more overall experience in this is 12th pro fight as we mentioned with Claxton fighting on the southpaw stance. Claxton's fought his entire career under the bright lights of Bellator MMA, but Gonzalez feels this is where he belongs and he feels he's faced a, a better quality of opponents overall. He's coming off a fourth round TKO win and he would love to stop Taiwan Claxton. In fact, he predicted a TKO triumph here tonight. Yeah, I don't know if I would say his quality of opponents. I mean, tell that to Emmanuel Sanchez. <laughs> See what he says. <laughs> Process didn't last too long. No. Claxton began wrestling in the eighth grade, Division II All American at King University in Bristol, Tennessee. Transferred to Ohio University, where he was a two time national qualifier. And there, the double jab by Gonzalez looking to close the distance, but Claxton able to disengage. Both fighters throwing everything with a lot of heat and speed. It's coming fast and it's coming hard. Gap kick to the lead leg of Claxton by Gonzalez. Featherweight champion, double champ for Bellator. Patricio Pitbull will meet AJ McKee in the final of the $1 million Bellator MMA Featherweight World Grand Prix. Stay there, stay there. Of course, Claxton participated in that tournament, losing to Emmanuel Sanchez. And already blood on the nose of Gonzalez. Under two minutes left here in the first. Those kicks are already having a little bit of an effect. You can see every time he takes that leg kick, Claxton does. He takes a little step back, and lets his leg reset a little bit. Lead right hand splits the guard of Claxton for Justin Gonzalez. All out. I like what Klax is doing. He's fainting and then changing the angle, but he's not always throwing off of it, which is fine. But he's got to be a little bit more busy because he's doing the same faint and the same angle change every time. Good one, two, that landed for Gonzalez. It is around where both Claxton and Gonzalez are trying to make the other thing. I think part of the fight game is the mental aspect under a minute. Let's go, let's go. Come on. Let's go. 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 Gonzalez is actually dipping down and making sure that he can get into the takedown or he can throw a combination off of that. So Tyler Claxton needs to slide his feet in instead of just lunging in. Twenty seconds left in the opening round. A tactical start here between the number nine ranked featherweight in Bellator MMA, Taiwan Claxton and Justin Gonzalez. Fighting for the first time in Bellator. Take a listen into this blue corner here of Justin Gonzalez. 
Hey, you're doing great. A little more, a little more push, okay? A little more pressure. You're doing great. Your your angles are good. A little more faking too. A little more faking. Keep circling left. You're doing perfect, man. Yeah. Go ahead. Hey, let's cut him off. He's running. You feel that, right? Yeah. How's he feel when you put him up against the cage a little bit, the boxing a little bit? Just cut him off with the footwork, eh? Gonzalez representing Top Notch Sports Academy and Trials MMA Claxton. Representing Elevation Fight Team. Both of them will look to make adjustments here as we head into round number two. Claxton looking to ready. Ready? Fight. Get back in the win column while Justin Gonzalez hopes to go 12 and 0. We heard from the Gonzalez corner as we begin round two. They'd like to see more pressure. Yeah, more pressure, but also more output. And on top of that output, cut the cage off when they see Tom and Claxton trying to move and circle out. I think everyone would like to see more output period here in round number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Justin following the, his corner's advice. Cut him off as soon as how you come out of those exchanges. Nice job. Wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. Let's go. 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 let us go 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 we heard from his corner. They'd like to see him utilize more feints as well, Josh. Yeah, he needs to utilize more feints, but he also needs to move his head because they keep yes. clashing hands, and I think that's kind of where that initial uh, cut from the nose. And it remains on the center line, and it was from a, a clash of heads. As we see often between the Orthodox and Southpaws, Claxton goes for the body lock, has it secured, tries to take Gonzalez off his feet. Yeah, nicely done by uh, Gonzalez to make sure he got his hips back. He still has to fight out of those double underhooks, though. Taiwan Claxton needs to get a little bounce off the cage so he can try to take him down in the open mat. Two minutes gone here in the second. This is up the middle by Claxton. This newer generation of fighters, they use the fences like a third leg to keep themselves stand, standing up. So what now you have to start doing is start pulling them out in the open because not a lot of fighters know how to defend the takedowns out in the open. And let's look for the trip. Returns, bring the hit. With the right leg, time. Yes, yes. There he goes. He turned him, but see, now he's going to use that fence. He's going to start wall walking against that fence, using that as like a support mechanism to get himself back to his feet. Nice takedown, though, by Taiwan Claxton. Claxton looking to well, yeah, figure four in one leg. Something you pioneered, Josh Thompson, back in the day. One of your uh, teammates in AK took it to another level. Uh, got by the name of a big Yeah, I don't like the two mile horn, but yeah. I just did for you, brother. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. But nice work. So now what Taiwan Claxton needs to do is he figure fours his leg. Now he start, needs to start taking his feet, Justin Gonzalez's feet, towards the fence so he can put Justin Gonzalez's back on the ground. Josh the Punk Thompson doesn't like to toot his own horn. Are you kidding me? Under two minutes left here in the second as Gonzalez gets back to his feet momentarily. But the determined Claxton delivering some knees. He's got to be careful he doesn't get his arm stuck in there. If Taiwan Claxton is able to keep that arm and then finish, get to the back, and it's over. Hey, it's hard to defend chokes when one arm's stuck. Claxton doing a great job of this positioning here. He's keeping sure he's staying on the back. Claxton has clasped his hand, the grip around the, the body of Owen, now releasing it. Defended by Gonzalez. Gonzalez wanting to maintain goal. You, I would think that Gonzalez would try to separate as much as possible, John. Gonzalez is a phenomenal wrestler himself. I mean, I'm just telling you right now, all he's got to do is bounce him off and get him off, too. If he can get to the top position and do some work in the last minute, he can still this round. And it is a bad 
final four position here under a minute left in the second round. Those old school food yeah. stands. <laughs> Shout out Marco Huas. The king of the streets. Don't wait. Come on, let's get it. Let's get it. You can hear Justin Gonzalez's corner yelling at him. Like, Don't wait. Let's go. You got to get after it and get it. Yeah. Fans here at the Mohegan Sun Arena would like to see a bit of a street fight break out as they have witnessed this battle of attrition along the fence. The overhooks by Claxton. 15 seconds left in the second round. Knees being exchanged with some space in between Claxton and Gonzalez as we head to the third and final round of this featherweight fight. That was a big deep breath. Listen, you're a better wrestler than him. He can't hang with you. I need more of that, okay? Mix it in with your strikes, Mix but let's wrestle. All I need is five minutes of everything you got. Leave it in here. Yes, sir. We, let's take everything Hands with us, right? the wrestling, and we're not letting up. We're not letting up. Listen to Steve. Good? Okay, I love it. Hey, that Tebow, your Tebow man, you're going to up the middle. Start with your jab and throw your team, right? And if he comes in on the strike, he gets his fucking head in the He's side. dipping it every Big time. Every time. Yeah. Yes. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah, we need it. Taiwan Claxton, many skills, including writing computer code. Both he and the debuting Justin Gonzalez trying to crack each other's code as they look to crack each other's skulls as we begin the third and final round. Gonzalez in his first Bellator MMA appearance. 11 and 0. Taiwan Air Claxton. All eight of his previous pro belts here in Bellator MMA looking to move to seven and two. Yeah, Tyler Claxton's corner told him to wrestle more. So close, use the punches yes. and, and that to close the distance. Good takedown take defense. Down. Yet Gonzalez able to skyme the takedown attempt. And again, Claxton with his back along the fence. You gotta circle with your legs. Well, Gonzalez's corner told him to throw the push kick up the middle and then finish it up with the right hand because he keeps, Tyler Claxton keeps dipping his head. So push kick him to the stomach or to the face as he came in. And now he's hearing the clinch. Yeah. And there is separation. Claxton from the southpaw stance. They collide. Scores with the jab on the exit. Gonzalez with the jab. Claxton using more feints, using more footwork. And with three minutes, 30 seconds left, you heard the corner. Both fighters need to push the pace here. Yeah, I think the second round went to Claxton, I believe, and the first round was a toss round. So it comes down to whoever can win this round. But Justin Gonzalez needs to win this round, I think, the most. Gonzalez with the scores with the low kick to the lead leg of Claxton. There's a kick blocked by Claxton. That's it. That's it. Let's go, Ty. Hand by Gonzalez. There's that wrestling in his corner was talking telling him to just come in on the exchanges, get in on drop, drop right down on the leg. Nicely done. Blackston changing levels, but now we're in the wake of Justin Gonzalez. Two and a half minutes left. Hammer fist from Gonzalez. Then an elbow. Classic gotta be careful keeping his hat in that position to be elbowed as well as the Kimura that's being set up. 
Here comes Ellis was looking for that double wrist lock for the Kimura attempt. As we come up on the final two minutes of this featherweight bout here at the Bellator 260 prelims, and Gonzalez on his back, open guard. Clarkston from top position. That was, a, base. that was a nice little arm drag. Gonzalez hit planted his wrist to the ground, and Clarkston actually just arm drug it by, was able to get him to roll through right to the top position. Nicely done. Take your toe out of the cage. Ruff, his toe's still in. Yep, heavy, heavy, Gonzalez heavy, dipping his toes into the deep end of the Bellator MMA featherweight division as he gets warned for using his toes along the cage, scrambles. But it says a lot about him coming in on his debut, fighting a top 10 fighter for Bellator. It says a lot, he's had some good moments in this fight. I don't know what's enough so far, but he's got a minute 17 left. You go, force it. Yep, yep, scoot, go, scoot. And they are just battling for the takedown, keeping this at close quarters. Final 60 seconds between Taiwan Air Claxton and Justin Gonzalez. Will Claxton bounce back from his second career loss? Will Gonzalez remain undefeated in his Bellator MMA debut? We're going to find out, but I'm telling you right now, Taiwan Claxton doing everything his corner told him to do. Whereas Justin Gonzalez is not listening to what his corner says. If he and make space, push kick up the middle, throw the right hand. That's, I think, what's going to be the difference in this judge's decision. Half a minute left. Foot stomps by Gonzalez, but they're not going to be enough. I still wonder, despite the fact that he is also a wrestler, whether or not he should try to separate himself and try to unload on Claxton. Easier said than done. Ten seconds left in the fight. Nice takedown at the very end. This kid got to get up, posture up, and just let it go. Both of them embrace the grind. Who will embrace the hard-fought victory? How did you see it overall, Josh? Don't put me in that I position. Know, I know, I got it. Hey, Come on. I, I, I put Big John in that position. I got to put you in that position. How many you could say. I, I honestly, I would Please probably, I would probably give it to Taiwan Claxton based off of the first two rounds. Though I would actually probably give the third round to Justin Gonzalez. It was close. I think that last little takedown, what even though that? it wasn't much out of it, but like yeah. it was a battle of jockeying for positions in the wrestling that whole round. So I would hands up. Yeah. It, look, you're, you're splitting hairs. To be honest. Yep. Well, yeah. we've. Well, we've uh, Way to we could see a, a split decision when all is said and done. In any event, it is up to the three judges at cage side. On, Both man. Claxton and Gonzalez believe yes. that they have done enough. But this is one of those fights where it could be 30 27 nice each direction. Right. Yeah. So for people at home watching, you guys got to understand it was a close fight. It really depends on how the judges saw that they gave more reward to one punches or wrestling or takedowns or whatever it was. Great to see the sign of uh, respect but an important fight obviously as they all are here in Bellator MMA but Gonzalez came in with plenty of hype after recording 11 consecutive wins and for Taiwan Air Claxton came up short in the Bellator featherweight world Grand Prix opening round in a razor thin split decision loss against JJ Wilson in his last fight. That came at a catch weight after Wilson missed weight last July. And then tonight here on, at 145, Woo. Justin Gonzalez, he feels two, two. he's done enough. Claxton had said he's finally at a place where he doesn't feel guilty about his success and doesn't feel guilty about putting his career first. Well, let's see if he finishes first in this fight. Let's go to Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your three judges at cage side. Your first judge, Brian Miners, scores the fight 29-28. He sees the fight for Gonzalez. Your second judge, Dave Torelli, scores the fight 29-28. He sees the fight for Claxton. 
Your third and final judge at Cakeside, Doug Crosby, scores the fight 29 to 28. He sees it for the winner pie split decision. Justin Gentry Gonzalez. It's a split decision win for Justin Gonzalez. Improving to 12 and 0 and picking up a hard fought victory in his Bellator MMA debut as he shades Taiwan Air Claxton, who tastes defeat for the second consecutive time and the third time in his career. Let's go to Josh Thompson. Justin Gonzalez, great performance, hard fought fight. Did you see the did you see the decision going your way as you were coming in here for the decision? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, you know, I think I controlled the striking, controlled the cage in the first. He got that takedown, probably stole the round for me in the second. Third was pretty close, but I think I was winning the striking battle. I took him down at the end and finished the way I had to. What really surprised you the most about him, and how did you have to make changes throughout the fight? Uh, he was strong, man. He was good. He's a good wrestler. I knew he was going to be a good wrestler. So, uh... I haven't been taken down much, so kudos to him, man. I, I much love, much respect. You know, he's coming in, he's ranked number nine right now in this division. You've now put yourself in that stamp. You should be probably ranked in that, in that top 10 now after that performance. I believe where do, so. Where do you see yourself and who would you like to fight next? Yo, man, uh, Bellator, I'd like to jump in the rankings if you don't mind. I think I just uh, deserved it. But, uh, you know, anybody in the rankings, man, that's my hit list. So all of them can get it, man. I got my eyes on all of them. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner, Justin Gonzalez. Justin Gonzalez should indeed crack the top 10 Bellator MMA featherweight division rankings after beating number nine ranked Taiwan Claxton via split decision here at Bellator 260 and celebrating with members from the Top Notch Sports Academy of Trials MMA as we go back to the fight desk for more reaction. Well, thanks, Mara. A fantastic back and forth between both those guys. Justin Gonzalez, Bellator debut. What do you think about what he was able to do tonight, John? Uh, I thought he did a very good job. He's very tight in what he did. I really saw the difference when all of a sudden the wrestling started coming out because they're both good wrestlers, and that usually leads to a striking battle. But it ended up being a wrestling battle in the end, and the judges in the end are giving it to Justin Gonzalez. Big win. Nice job. To be fair, you know, it's, it's a, as, as you say, I agree with the fact that usually when you see two wrestlers get together, they decide to just, you know, let's scrap the wrestling and then, you know, we'll just, we'll just throw hands. But I actually felt that Claxton took the better of the wrestling and the, the striking was fairly even, so I was surprised at the result, actually. I kind of agree with you. I actually thought in the end, I thought the wrestling, the, the better wrestling, grappling art was Claxton, but the judges disagree. Well, uh, yeah. Gonzalez moving to, uh, what is it? He 12 and 0, but the interesting fact, he is 21 and 0. It's a fact that uh, John pointed out, if you combine his amateur and pro career, very impressive, never lost. All right. Well, we have one more fight to go before our main card starts on Showtime at the top of the hour. And I'm kicking off with the welterweights. We have DeMarquez Jackson versus Mark Leminger. Then we've got Aaron Pico. He makes his return to face Aiden Lee. And of course, we've also got the show stopping Paul Daly and the ass kicking machine Jason Jackson. I love being able to say that. <laughs> and then it's all anticipation of our main event. It's the welterweight world title on the line. Douglas Lima defends his belt against Yaroslav Amasov. And once again, we will head across the pond to get a fight preview from Gareth A. Davies. What a main event we have tonight with the huge physical presence of reigning Bellator welterweight champion Douglas Lima defending his crown against the undefeated Yaroslav Amazov. The three-time world sambo champion from Ukraine, Amazov faces one of the sport's standout champions in Lima who has notched up notable victories over Rory McDonald, Andre Koreshkov twice, Michael Page, Paul Daly and Lorenz Larkin in a Bellator career approaching almost a decade. Lima has power, poise, presence, and precision, but more than that, he has experience. Lima has been to a fifth round seven times, whereas Dynamo has never been beyond three. In this one, if it goes beyond three, the championship rounds could really be telling. All to fight for. Over and out from London.
Well, thanks. You know, we just heard Garrett say that Dan Lambert over at AKA, he says that Amosov is the best wrestler in the gym, and that's pretty impressive, guys, considering he has no wrestling background. And have you seen what he's done here in Bellator against NCAA champions, NCAA All-Americans? How is that possible, John? <laughs> to say it's possible, it, it seems impossible. What he does is he doesn't have that wrestling background, but he's got that Sambo background. And Sambo brings in not only wrestling from the Russian side, which is incredible, also the judo and so a lot of the things when he gets tied up with his opponent his opponents or even in the gym look at that's against Ed Ruth that's a three-time NC2A champion look at him shucking by look at him get around to the back this is what makes Yaroslav Amazov special he just uses different foot sweeps and he uses a lot of judo throws he'll use an Uchimata he'll use a Haragosh the guys are not anticipating that movement and he just becomes successful and he just is an outstanding wrestler, a la a George St. Pierre, who never wrestled. That's right. Well, let's talk about the, the guys that he trains with over at ATT down in Florida. You know, they've got an impressive undefeated record. I think it's like 49-0. and 0. The guys that he's training with there, what does that do for your confidence? When you're in the gym day in, day out, Michael, with guys, everybody's winning. It's got to feel good. A little pressure, though, i got to assume, too, huh? You know what? I don't think it's necessarily pressure. I think it just it, it helps you rise to the occasion. When when you surround yourself with champions, the, the results are going to be you're going to most likely be a champion. So it's about surrounding yourself with the right people. So he's fortunate to have those people around him. And then to hear from a lot of people in the gym, as I've heard many a times, that he's out wrestling these guys as well. Unbelievable. So we know that's going to be a ma massive factor in this fight. Well, we talk about Douglas Lima now. And if you look at his opponents and who he's fought, uh, you know, you look at like a, a Roy McDonald, or Andre Korshkov, who he's fought three times, very similar kind of style, well-rounded like Amosov. What can we take from those fights, specifically, let's say, against Korshkov, on how we feel like he's going to handle himself inside the cage tonight? Well, when you're looking at a guy named Andre Korshkov, you're looking at a guy that's dynamic in, in the striking range. He's really good with the spinning attacks, and his wrestling was outstanding. And in his first time of, of facing Douglas Lima, he had Douglas Lima in trouble with wrestling, and Douglas did have a knee injury, and that led to a lot of problems for him. But it was what Douglas Lima learned and how he came back in the second, third fight that says everything that you need to know. He was heavy on top, of course, got the time, and he wore him out with the grappling and then gets to the rear naked choke and puts him unconscious. Douglas Lima always improves in areas when he knows what somebody does. He works very hard at improving those areas and making it so it's a strength instead of a weakness. It's very difficult for anybody that I've watched take Lima down. And even when you do get him down, he doesn't stay there very long. And this is why I feel it's going to be a, you know, a very interesting. This is why I feel it's going to be inter interesting bout because let's say he does get him down. How many times can he get him down, and then how long can he keep him down for? How effective can he be on the floor? That's going to play the role. Another, I yeah, I agree. And as I say, another interesting element, obviously. Obviously, the question that still needs to be answered is Douglas Lima has gone those championship rounds. Amazov is not. That, you know, and that's so big. It's it, to sit there and just to say it. Amazov has 13 first-round finishes. We've seen him in three-round fights where he's gotten tired. His last fight against Logan Storley, he out wrestled an All-American wrestler, made him look at times like, "Wow, I am the better wrestler," just like they're talking about from ATT. But he did outpace himself, and in that third round, Logan Storley came on and was putting the whooping on Yaroslav. So he needs to maintain that level where he's comfortable and not overextending. I feel with Logan Storley, sorry, he was pushing the pace. And that made him, you know, I it's a different fight with Lima. Lima kind of has a very slow, steady pace. So I feel he'd be able to last the five rounds. And Amosov also told us he was working on his cardio with his coach from Ukraine for this camp. All right, it's time to get back down to the fight action. Moro? All right, Jen, thank you very much. We will wrap up the main event of Bellator 260 with a welterweight title fight. We wrap up the preliminary portion of Bellator 260 with the welterweight fight between Kyle Crutchmer and Levon Schokelli. Tonight, one final prelim remains. And now your first fighter. Please welcome Levon Schokelli. All right, Michael.
Michael C. Williams says it with a little more panache and flair. It is Levon Chokeli. He's 24 years of age, making his Bellator MMA debut undefeated. He feels he should be 10 and 0, not 9 and 0 with one no contest. He knocked out Conrad Drishka in Germany in February of last year. Afterward, the referee ruled the fight a no contest after saying that Chokeli used an illegal strike, which Chokeli says he didn't. But it will be an official no contest, so he's looking to keep that train moving in a positive direction here tonight in his Bellator debut. As long as he's undefeated, what do you care if there's a no contest? I get it. Okay, one more win on your record. I understand that. It would be a perfect 10, John. But Chokely possesses power in both hands, and he's aggressive, so this is going to be a fun, fun fight. Yeah, like all fighters, Chokely wants to earn more bucks for his bang, and so far, he's earned more money per second than many of his peers. All nine wins have come via first round knockout. And now, making his way, Kaiho Kutschman. After starting his career with six straight wins, Kyle Crutchmer tasted defeat for the first time last October at Bellator 249 against Kemran Alachinov, losing via unanimous decision. The 28-year-old Crutchmer telling us it was a learning lesson. He says he's a wrestler at heart, and he stood all three rounds. He feels that again, like a lot of fighters tasting defeat for the first time. It has to be a learning experience, or what's the point, John? Yeah, it really just comes down to full disclosure. I've trained with Kyle Crutchford. I see Kyle Crutchford all the time in the gym. I've known him for years, but he is a phenomenal wrestler. But in that fight, he decided to stand, and I think that was the thing that worked against him. He's going to have to get back to his wrestling in this case. Let's take a look at the tail of the tape for this welterweight encounter at Bellator 260. Yeah, the records is really what stands out. 9-0 for Chocolate, and then you've got 6-1 with Kyle Crushmer. Both of them are good fighters. Both of them at the top of their food chain right now, so we're going to see what happens. Who's going to end up getting the win? Here is MCW. From Mohegan Sun Arena, the time has come to conclude the prelims here at Bellator 260 with three five-minute rounds in the welterweight division. Introducing the blue corner at six foot weighing in 170 pounds even, making his Bellator debut. He enters undefeated, nine wins, no losses, hailing from Tbilisi, Georgia, presenting Levan Chokali. And across the cage, his adversary fighting out of the red corner. At five foot nine, weighing in 170 and three quarter pounds. As a professional, he stands near perfect. Six victories, just one defeat. Fighting out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Kyle Kirchner. And the referee in charge, Dan Bergliata. Referee will be Dan Mergliana for this welterweight matchup scheduled for three five-minute rounds. Crutch Burr probably needs to rely on his wrestling against a guy in Chokoli whose right, nine wins have all so come good. in the opening round due to his strikes. Chokoli in the blue gloves, Crutch Burr in the red gloves. This is round number one. Yeah. It's important for Kyle Crusher to not make sure that it's a focus that he has to rush into the takedown, especially in the beginning round, in this beginning round. You gotta set up these takedowns with his striking, the inside leg kick, the outside leg kick, as well as with the hands. Crutchmer, a two-time All-American at Oklahoma State, a, an MMA pipeline. Randy Couture, Daniel Cormier, who has worked with all of the wrestlers at AKA Josh. Yeah, you got the Rochelle brothers. I mean, you've got so many. So many. Yeah, Nikki Picknicky. Nick. Yeah, Pitchnicky. <laughs> or Pickney. Well, Crutchmer here against 
Levon Chokoli and immediately Crossbar goes for the takedown. Secures it, but Chokoli looking to choke Crutchmer in the meantime. Kyle doing a good job of trying to walk past the legs. He's got to be careful getting into that half guard. This is where he needs to do his work. He needs to settle him in, make sure he keeps his back flat to the ground. So it didn't take long for Crutchmer to bring this fight to where he wanted it to take place, on the ground. Working from the, well, trying to work now from the closed guard of Chokoli, who was trying to stay busy from the bottom, but Crutchmer doing a good job of wanting to pass here. Nice job. Chokoli, though, was quick on the transition for the armbar. Just didn't have it quite tight enough. Kyle was able to pull the arm out and get the pass. Crutchmer working from side control, heavy on Chokoli. You can see that Kyle's already trying to get to that crucifix position where he's trying to trap that, that right arm between his legs. So you start laying down those elbows. Secures it on Chokoli. Chokoli drops an elbow. Has to be careful to not behind the head of Grutchmer. Watch her there. Or in the 12 to 6. Watch the arm bar. Two and a half. Keep your elbows inside. These takedowns are nice, but he's got to be very cautious about how much he lifts and how much energy he puts out because as the fight goes on, the takedowns get harder and harder to get. Good job. Eric telling us that his throat is camp. They, they, Implored him, you know, don't go away from what you're best at. It's sometimes hard for wrestlers because what happens is they find out and they, they, they fall in love with punching people. Yeah, they fall in love with the fact that the majority of wrestlers possess punching power. So when they start touching people and they start hurting people, they realize, hey, this is more fun and less energy. So they try to get into that business. Other side, Tom. When I talk about wrestlers, I talk about guys like Randy Couture, who never got away from that business. Chokoli with the, with the triangle positioning here. Chokoli looking for his first submission after all nine of his wins came. That's it. Touch power, all nine wins in the opening round, and he has a minute and change left to work with from this position, looking for the triangle. That's that's in tight right there. He's also, too, he's got Couture's arm is kind of straight, so if he's able to hip up in, you can see him trying to make that transition the arm. Nice job by Crutchmer escapes now in north-south position. Crutchmer has an anaconda choke arm triangle and a guillotine on his resume. Under a minute left here in the first frame. As we put a cap on the proceedings of the six-fight preliminary card of Bellator 260 main card coming up at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific. Bellator 260 on showtime as Crutchmer gets another takedown. Less than half a minute remaining in the first round. What Kyle needs to do is put his forehead to the to the cage, posture up, hip in, and start laying down some leather because even though he's had dominant round in terms of the wrestling, a lot of the submission threats and a lot of the activity has come from Chokley from the bottom. Nice move. Nice Nasty elbow there and another elbow strike by Crutchmer. Crutchmer will close out the round with Chokoli on his back as we head to the second stanza. Crutchmer sticking with what got him to the dance, Josh Thompson utilizing his wrestling. That's going to be the key throughout this whole fight with Chokoli. It has to do with him making him work harder okay. between the rounds. Try to the between the, in the rounds. Nice deep breath. All right? Try to, get, try to get those elbows on him some, okay? Beautiful work. Not even breathing. You look great out there, okay? Hey, you're faster. Use that. Let let it go. Get the takedown. Get coming get up your hands at up nine on his face, Eastern, okay? six Pacific. As I mentioned, Bellator MMA on Showtime. It will culminate with a much anticipated welterweight championship fight.
Douglas Lima begins his record third reign by defending against the number one contender, the 25 0 Yaroslav Amasov. You do not want to miss Bellator 260, the main card coming up at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, only on Showtime. All right, second round, gentlemen. And it's go time as we begin round number two. Kyle Crutchmer in the red gloves. Undefeated Levon Chokili making his Bellator MMA debut in the blue gloves in the wrestling for Crutchmer. Paid dividends in the first five minutes in the ground control. To Major Tom, no, but three minutes and 23 seconds meant that Crutchmer was in control on the ground. No, I don't need your interplanetary thought, Mr. Thompson. Opening 30, was, opening minute of the I was still trying to do the math. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nasty. Calf kick by Chokely. Kyle's probably doing is he's waiting for Chokely to go ahead and commit to a strike so he can drill lower his level and get in deep on the legs. Don't have to work as hard. This is what you're gonna see from, from Levon Chokely though, is that he is someone that throws everything with a lot of power, so he will leave himself available to be taken down because he does extend himself a lot to unleash that, those hands. Crutchman fainting, trying to get Chokley to commit Chokley with that lead right hand. 90 seconds gone, the shot by Crutchman. Beautiful job. Crutch is very good at, at basically like a, yeah, a very fast entry as well as he's very famous for his duck under. So what he did there is he dropped in on the double legs and he turned that corner real fast. He didn't settle in on the bottom. Nicely done by Kyle Crutchman. Good posture, keep your elbows in good position. Get some of that smash. Step over. Chokely from the Step bottom, delivering the elbow strikes. Instead of trying to control the posture of Kyle Crutchmer, and Crutchmer now being neutralized by Chokely. The overhooks. Yeah, he's just really trying to control Kyle so he doesn't can't posture up and let down some leather. Kyle needs to elevate that right leg and put his knee underneath it so that it makes it harder for Chokely to go to that side to stand up. See, now he's using that foot to push him back and create space, which eventually he ended up using that foot to hit that hook sweep as well. Chokely active hips now along the fence. Half butterfly. Now giving up his back. This is not where Chokley wants to be with Kyle Crutchmer. Kyle's got the two on one. He's going to ride him forward. See how he's trying to put his forehead to the mat? So he's going to ride him forward there. And so he's going to put heavy weight on him. And some elbows from the bottom against Crutchmer by Chokley as Crutchmer back inside control along the fence. Under two minutes left in the second round. Cross face. Yep, head on the front. Kyle needs to do is start putting that left knee on the belly so he can start making him carry his weight, especially on that abdomen area, starts making you more tired so the takedowns will come easier throughout the fight. Kyle Crutchmer representing one of the most decorated gyms in MMA history, AKA in a San Jose, a place you know intimately well, Mr. Thompson, while Levon Chokely, he represents Phoenix Sport Academy out of Tbilisi, Georgia. Under 90 seconds left in the second with Crutchmer controlling from top position and side control. Even though he's controlling all the positions, he needs to get busier with yes. striking because right now, as, jo as Big John McCarthy and I always talk about, it, it's not just about controlling the position, it's about the work you do from that position. Because right now, Chokley was actually landing the better elbows from the bottom. He's also threatening more of the submissions from the bottom. So he's got to be very careful about just holding him. He's got to be doing work from the top. Final minute, always learn a thing or two when you listen to the Weighing In podcast with Big John McCarthy and Josh DePont Thompson. And here with 50 seconds left in the second, Crutchmer needs to take advantage of the dominant position, but Chokely doing a tremendous job of 
stymieing the offense and doing a good job of controlling Kutchmer's posture here with 35 seconds left in the round. So now that he's put into full guard, what he needs to do is put his forehead against the fence, sit up, posture up, hip into him, and start letting the punches go. Because if your body is over them, then it makes it harder for them to stand up knowing they have to get past your head and your body to stand back to their feet. Final 10 seconds of the middle frame. Crutchmer doing just enough. Some old school heel strikes a la Hoist Gracie by Levon Chokely as we go to the final frame. At the end of the day, it is all about damage, imposing your will and skill, and trying to defeat your opponent. And we are down to the final five minutes between Kyle Crutchmer in the red gloves, two and one here in Bellator MMA, and Levon Chokely making his Bellator MMA debut, unbeaten at nine and zero with one no contest. Who wants it more? Ready? Final round. Let's go, Joe. And a nasty one from the Southpaw Chokely. And again, Josh battering the body of Crutchmer early in the final round. Yeah, I think he understands that Kyle is getting a little tired from the takedowns, and that's why he's throwing heat to the body. He's got to be careful that Kyle doesn't catch one of those, and he ends up on his back again for the rest of the round. Ooh, that one landed clean. I heard Kyle take a step back and drop his elbow now. And Crutchmer. Changing levels, shoots for the takedown, secures it, and he adheres his corner's instructions to shut him down. You hear the corner of Kyle Kreshmer and Ron Kessler. He's telling him to go ahead and switch sides. He wants him to try to keep his head on one side and also take his body to the other side. That'll help take away some of the submission and keep their back flat to the ground. Try to get your elbow up on him. Knees tight. Knees tight. Keep pulling him down. Crutchmer told us he wanted to showcase his growth as a fighter. Wanting to show the ability to, to bounce back after tasting defeat for the first time. Always a bitter pill to swallow, Josh. And yet going back to his bread and butter, his wrestling base, hoping to wear down and defeat a man who's yet to taste defeat. It's just a lot of work to do what Kyle Crutchmer is doing. I think that's why fighters tend to get away from it. Wrestlers tend to get away from it when they start fighting. Is that it's a ton of work and they start to get exhausted. The most vulnerable part is after you don't get a takedown and you know somebody is back on their feet and they're a striker to have to deal with that. And you saw a little bit of that in the very beginning of this round. Chokley came out realizing that there, was, there wasn't a whole lot for him to do. He needed to go on. Chokley uh, as well, though, with time running out now, doesn't want to settle by any means in this position. I know easier said than done when you have a, a wrestler like Crutchmer on top, but he either needs to try to force the stand-up for the referee or try to somehow turn the tables here along the fence as we reach the midway point of the final round. There needs to be that sense of urgency. Yeah, when I talked to Big John, 
I talk to Big John all the time. I'm sure you do. When we talk As about this type of position, we're both going to find out the difference between a Darce choke and an Anaconda choke uh, before you gotta, the end of the night. got to throw me under. <laughs> no, no, I threw myself under the bus. But what were you going to say there, John? It's, but it's those small little body shots that Kyle's doing, the small little head shots. He calls those like wrist strikes. Really, right. you don't really count those as a, as a judge. You count, sure, you count the positioning and the head position. But Kyle needs to be busier in terms of throw at least one or two hard strikes and go back to some soft strikes. Mix it up while you're trying to ground a pound. Because this is kind of a bad look, I think, for the judges, because Chokely is actually trying to do more work from the bottom, even though he's not having success. And yet, Quachmer is staying busy again with, like you mentioned, the, 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 the strikes that Big John, you know, awards just a one, two, and, and not a lot of damage by any means, but staying busy enough to impress the referee and allow him to continue to work from this position. Again, a minute and a half left. And Jokely again, yes, looking for the armbar from the bottom. Still looking for his first submission victory in this is 11th professional fight. Hands off the Half butterfly hook. Well, now Y Vance and Chokely with an opportunity here, but now momentarily giving up his back. Under a minute left in the fight. Yeah, I thought he was going to start to get away like he did earlier in the first round, but he wasn't able to finish the rotation, so he ended up in that, we call it the KC position, where one leg is between his with his back turned, and that's not a good position to be in. The sounds of battle with 30 seconds left, the deep breathing. These two have been in the cage for 14 minutes and 40 seconds, and now final 15 seconds of the fight, and Crutchmer content to ride it out for top position. He must feel he has done enough to secure the victory in keeping Chokely on the canvas. It will be up to the three judges to determine the victor in our final preliminary fight here at Bellator 260. You know the question that's coming to you, Josh. <laughs> how do you how do you see this fight on your highly unofficial scorecard? It's got to be 30-27, you would think, but I have been, been proven wrong several times tonight, as we have figured out. As we take a look at some of the action. But the story of the, the story of the night tonight was the wrestling, the wrestling of Kyle Kretschmer, that Oklahoma State style wrestling that some of the, some of the best MMA fighters have come out of that college. And I'm just telling you, the way he sets things up, boom, he caught the kick, stepped in, locked the hands. As soon as he locks his hands. Chokely was going down. And that's how, that was the story of tonight. I would like to, for him to be a little bit more busy in terms of the ground and pound, but when it came down to it, he did a great job. Did you hear what he said? No, I, anyway, let's look at the, uh, well, the strikes landed, or even ground control, big, all. Kyle Crutchmer and in the takedown department, pitching the shutout, but, you know, striking, we saw Levon Chokely with those kicks as well. Uh, I think all six of those came styles. in the third round, though. All six of those hard kicks came in the third round. You know, there's probably one maybe in the first, but the story of the tape tonight was the, obviously the takedowns and the control. Official decision here is Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, for the decision, we'll go to your three judges Ken Coffey, Jacob Montalvo, Michael Murtha. All seen exactly the same 30 27 for the winner by unanimous decision, Kyle Crutchman. Kyle Crutchman bounces back from his first career loss, now handing Levon Chokely his first career setback in Chokely's Bellator MMA debut as Crutchman 
improves to three and one in Bellator, seven and one overall in Bellator MMA competition coming up at the top of the hour. Nine Eastern, six Pacific, Bellator 260 will bring you a four fight card culminating with the welterweight championship fight. The champion Douglas Lima defending against the unbeaten number one ranked contender Yaroslav Amosov. Join us at the top of the hour for Bellator MMA on Showtime. Douglas Lima is the division king. That right hand, boom! Lock and lock. And three-time Bellator world champion. Yaroslav Amosov is seemingly unbeatable at 25 and 0, riding the longest active winning streak in MMA. Something's gotta give. Are you tough enough? Better prove it. Bellator MMA live tonight on Shota, where warriors rule. Pico beginning to oh! performance by Chris Lozano against Brent Wheatman, but Brent Wheatman walked into a lot of punches. Didn't seem to want to use his whole toolkit. Seemed to want to walk in and bang, and he can't do that against Chris Lozano. I think Lima's doing the right thing, angling, trying to throw him a lot of looks. Jimmy Lozano was emphatic in telling us, punches and bunches. I need to have a high volume of punches. Very true. Oh, right hand! That's it! That is it! Game, set, match, Douglas Lima, and he punches his ticket to the tournament championship. Wow, welcome to our top 10 knockouts in Bellator history. That was a gorgeous right hand. That's how you're supposed to do it. Through the jab and then bang, right on the jaw. Incredibly accurate right cross. But those are more to aggravate and just make you move where that elbow causes damage and that's what the judges are looking at. Looking for a Dars choke here. Remember, Rick getting Lewis that in place. Been submitted. 29th pro fight. He's almost got that in position. Rickles has got his arm up where it should, and that use of that leg. Yep. It is all over. Amazon, the first to submit the cape man. Just gonna say the use of that leg is creating a pressure on that neck with that choke. Here you go, when he gets to that half guard position, you see that arm starting to sink in. It comes from under the arm to the neck and you see him trying to bring his arm up and through, just getting that position. Now he slides it, gets the hand to the elbow and now he's got that crank. Look at the position of Rickles' head. He is being choked. That forearm is against his carotid. There's nothing he can do. He seemed genuinely offended that Josh Koscheck wasn't able to fight on this card. Fingers up, Paul, both of you. He has taken the opportunity to have a stage. To oh, a huge right hand, and we are done. You wait for that vicious left hook of Paul Daly. He never had to use it. He said, I wanted that knockout, that stunner, that one shot face plant. I haven't had that yet in Bellator. Well, he just got it. You're waiting on that left, waiting on that left, and all of a sudden, that happens. And Paul Semtex Daly, who had the stage to himself tonight, holds serve. He earns the win. Forgiving. A Pico not wanting to be very forgiving against Justin Lin. Lin with that head kick blocked. Pico beginning to. Oh! He had had success early with his striking. And look at this left hand right to the chin. Look at the head whip. And that is it. Cutting the strings on a puppet. That's what that looks like. Bang! Hey, 
Nice. Again, the uppercut. He was showing the rear knee as well. There we go. Oh, oh. what about that from Aiden Lee? Oh, big man in the cage. Big man in the cage. Tremendous oh, power. Yep, it was a kick. He was showing the knee earlier. That's the thing. Those rear tools are really key when you know a guy is going to shoot on you. There was an uppercut there. There was a knee he was fainting, and then he actually whipped it into a kick. Excellent vision. Remarkable timing as well here from Aiden Lee. And he stopped Patley and walked off. He knew it was done. Great stoppage as well. As I walk away, my bodyguard hey. no longer no exists. No longer, my friend. <laughs> Look at Claxon, man. Very athletic, but real quick with those. Oh! Hit his own lover. Just like that. We're talking about athleticism and speed. Look at that flying knee. Hit right through the center with the knee. No follow-up, no ground and pound, one and done. Boom. That would have knocked out any one of the vision. Look at the height he gets on. He has trouble landing properly. In 15 professional fights, Beck Rollins has not been submitted. Knocked out twice, defeated by decision a half dozen times. Nice job by Beck to get her hips to the ground. And she tries to get the reversal. You can see the damage that one leg kick did. Look at the left thigh area of Beck Rawlings. You can see that one kick that put her on the ground damaged her big time. Going for the knee bar. Yep. Hit is all over. Here comes this leg kick right off of the shots. Boom. Look at it, just take Beck Rawlings' legs right out from her. That's what put them on the ground. That's where we got all of these different positions. And right here, she sets up this knee bar attempt. Now she's got it locked in. Now she extends her hips. And that's why you see Beck Rawlings down. You talk about a crucifix. It was the crucifix that helped him to his first win against Baby Slice. Now he's on the other end of a grappling battle so far dominated by Nick Newell. Nick Newell, very good body position here. You see him, he's creating pressures at different times, just making Corey work underneath him, has landed some good strikes, looking to go towards the mount. There it is. This could be it. It is an arm triangle choke right now. It's tight, you can see him having problems with it. Normally we want to go to a side position like he is cross body, there you go. Very tight. He's got a good squeeze on it, he's still there. And he's on the other. Nick Newell by submission. And this takedown right here is not normal. He's got that head hooked with Corey's arm, but it's the position that he did starts to turn him. Brings him down to the ground. You see Corey getting into that half guard, but then he gets into the mount, steps off once he has that choke engaged. You see Corey trying to push his arm up and bring it against Nick Newell's head, but there's just not enough strength going out there. It's too much squeeze. And that's why you see Corey Browning having to tap out before he goes to sleep. That's the kind of thing a dad says right? at this, at this yeah. time. Halfway, halfway. Well, karma fighting here, John. Halfway. Having his first fight hey, at the same location that his guy. father had his last professional fight here in the Wingstar World Casino and Resort. Yeah. Hey, don't kill Chris with a Kimura win back in June of 2000. to hide that elbow if he can. That choke will work, especially if he utilizes his hips like he's starting to do right there. Stretching him out. Hit is all over. Just like that, Lucas Brennan, victorious in his professional debut. Look how he sets this up. Look at that knee ride, Mike. Right to the back. And once he gets that hook in, he's set. Takes, here's what we're talking about. Look at that body triangle, pushes his hips, extends Thomas Lopez out, palm to palm, rear naked choke. Beautiful technique. Douglas Lima. 
He's terrified. I mean, look at what he did to Michael Venom Page. The belt belongs once 